All right, Jack Cruz, welcome back to the Lifestylist Podcast, dude. I'm live. I like it. Live um, in LA. I'm super stoked, dude. We've had, for those of you listening, we've had a long day of uh, sharing a lot of information so far. We're at the Neil Strauss Intensive in uh, Los Angeles and Marina Del Rey specifically. And we just went for about, I don't know, four hours or something. Q&A. Down. Yeah, <laughs> with the Q&A after Jack's talk and stuff. So. Well, Jack didn't even talk. Oh, Jack. that's true. We did a panel and then a Q&A afterward, which turned into the Jack Cruz Q&A. So, <laughs> um, you know, as, as, as it happens. <laughs> but I'm super stoked to sit down with you in person. Uh, you're one of my favorite, you know, my listener's favorite guests. People always ask, get Jack Cruz back on and ask him about this, ask him about that. And well, now, this is about the only way you're going to get me in L.A. If you get the red light right. doing it, I'm, I'm okay got, with and that. And we're using batteries for the headphones, so there's a lot less EMF than if that thing was plugged into the wall. Yeah, this so, I'd only do this for Luke. I appreciate that. So, yeah, so here we are, dude. Uh, let's start out with what's new and exciting in your life. Well, a lot. I mean, I'm getting ready to open up uh, the Cruise Longevity Center on December 27th. I mean, today is what? 13th 14th so two weeks away um that's a huge project it's been a 10-year journey i didn't think it, we'd ever get around to doing it um so if people decide they want to hire jack cruz to be their doctor they're going to have an opportunity to kind of do that now unfortunately it's going to only be open to my members of record i think uh the 31st of december this year so you only have two weeks left and then the members get first dibs um, I don't know how many slots I'm going to open up. It's going to depend on kind of my time. Um, I'm thinking 25 to 50 uh, total. Um, and then if they don't fill it up, then I'm going to open it up to the public. Because we already have a wait list, I think, of close to 900 people. Damn. So this would be essentially a retreat center where people No, this is going to be – this is actually going to be like the doctor's visits. But what, what the oh. doctor is going to be doing at this place – is going to be kind of what, you know, what you and I were just talking about with those guys in the Q&A. Like, right. you know, you got a pretty cool example because those guys were asking me clinically oriented questions and you got to hear me say yeah. why I can't say many of these things online because that would be considered practicing medicine without a license. Right. So that's the kind of the deal. A lot, a lot of people who, who are in with me, they were like, look, I want some more. Well, if you want more, you got to really join the farm and become a charter member. Right. And this is, to be quite honest with you, Luke, I haven't told anybody this. Or you're the first person that's ever heard it. In fact, none of the guys here heard it. Not all my members are going to be qualified to become charter members on the farm either. You're going to have to qualify yourself. And I'm getting ready to give the qualifying data Monday night. When I actually, when I go home from L.A., I have a Q&A for the December webinar, and I, I did something really bizarre with this December webinar. Usually my webinars go for about an hour or two. This one was eight minutes, and it was just like, this is what the prices are going to be for the public. I'm not telling you what the member prices are. You come to the Q&A. And I usually do the Q&As on Sunday night, but I'm going to be here in L.A., so we're going to do it Monday, and that's what I'm going to tell them. And I don't even think my social media people – my clinic people, they know what's coming. I actually wrote out on the plane here my ideas about how I'm going to do this. That That's how I roll. I mean, Matt knows. He's here. Every time I go do a talk, it's kind of like I got to be in the room and I got to feel it. And I was thinking about when I was coming here, like really why I was coming. And I was coming because Neil's group of dudes, you know, remember when we first met the first time? I mean, we had a good time, but these guys have a good brotherhood. And I think this is, like, really important. The, the reason why I, I'm glad you and I are seeing each other face-to-face -face is because when you're on social media, you have an ambient awareness of somebody, you really don't know that person. You can't tap their passion until you really see them in action. And when you see them interacting with other people and how things go, um, to me, that's important. And I think what Neil's trying to build here is, like, a brotherhood and a sisterhood. There's some sisters in there, too. Um they're all trying to help each other get better. And that's what you're doing on your podcast. That's what I try to do on my blog. It's what I try to do even in my day job as a neurosurgeon. I'm, I mean, I'm in this to try to help people. And I can't help everybody. I mean, some people are beyond help. Uh, some people won't do what it takes to do the right things. Some people have just been told so many things that are wrong 
and they can't unlearn to relearn. You know, there's there's so many different angles, but the cool thing is I think when you meet somebody face-to-face, kind of like what we just did, I, I mean, I'd like to hear your two cents on kind of what went down in the Q&A. Like, what, were you, what was Luke thinking when I was talking to those guys? When you were sitting down there with your bud – and you heard me go. What were you? What was going through your mind? Well, I think where you and I are aligned is that we always look to nature, and so I don't think nature makes mistakes. Neither do I, I. I believe in God. You know, I just. I mean, I used to be nervous about using that word, and oh, I don't know. I don't. Want, I'm like, fuck it, man. That's, dude. I'm the reason I am not a heroin addict and a crack addict right now sitting here. And the reason I'm healthy and alive and happy and helping other people and being of service in the world is because of God. And you know, it's not a religious God for me. It's just, it's nature. Mm-hmm. So when you talk half the time, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Cause it's too scientific and geeky and I'm just but not you, wired you, that you, way. You got what I talked to the, today though. Yeah. But in, I didn't make it too crazy today. <laughs> no, you didn't. But intuitively, I get it because it always goes back. Your stuff is light, water, and magnetism. And those are the forces of nature that make things work in nature. And so it makes sense to me enough on that level. And then I can see for me kind of where I'm deviating. And I do a lot of shit that you don't agree with too. Um, I think that's because I live in an area that's so out of alignment with nature that I have to fucking fight extra hard. So yeah, we have my Jew. For those of you watching, we have the Jew red light panel here. Now, if I lived somewhere uh, and had a lifestyle where I could go out and get natural sunlight at sunset and sunrise, and you know, I could get my red light like that, I'd do it. But I'm pushing hard and I'm rocking and rolling, and so you know, I kind of go a bit extreme with the biohacking stuff um, to the point where it defies some of the laws of nature. But a lot of it's still based on nature. So when you were talking earlier. It makes perfect sense to me, and I think that's what's great is being able to meet people kind of at their level, right? Uh So you have the geeks in the room that are like, oh, I understand the quantum biology or the physics of something that you're talking about. And then you have someone that's just like, all right, I'm sold. What do I do? And that's where I come in. And that's where, you know, we have Matt Maruka sitting here in, in the room with us. And um, that's what? where guys like Matt come in is they go, oh, you OK, so you don't want to understand all the science of it. Cool. Can you wake up at sunrise and be in the sun naked? All right. There you go. Can you drink clean water? Cool. There you go. Can you work on uh, mitigating blue light and EMF? Cool. It's actually not that complicated. But yet, like you said earlier, you have to understand the why. So I like what you were saying because you scare the shit out of me. And I'm like, fuck, I got to leave L.A. <laughs> And now I know why. Well, it's not because you don't the, like L.A. It's because it's antithetical to right. human biology to be here. Right. Well, it's it's not any system that we're this, – this technology used to be an oasis that we got some progress from. We've abused it so much in our environment that now nature is the oasis. And that's the crazy part. Right. And I look at L.A. as a technology jungle. You know, that's why I, the thing I was wondering – what I wanted to ask you is get your response. When we were doing the Q&A together that was on the Facebook live feed, when I said I was the last one to talk about supplements, when I said what I said about over supplement, it comes from being undereducated about light. I want to know what you thought about that answer. Did it surprise you when I said it? And when I said it, what did you think? No, I actually really identified with it because – I'm 48, dude, and I'm feeling the effects of living in the environment that I live in. I mean, and I can't even get good sleep because not only the EMFs where I live, but, but the- tell them, tell them since we're doing this yeah. live, tell them what you said literally right at the end when I told you about flying back in LA. I mean, share it because to me that was yeah. that was like rock star moment when you said it. Well, there's been a huge mystery for me. Um, I'm always hacking air travel. I mean, I did a, a live feed the other day, and I mean, I've got. PMF shit. I have the blue blocking glasses. I have the hydrogen. I mean, the shit I bring on the plane, <laughs> I get stopped in security. Every, I mean, they they don't know what the fuck to make of me when I go through TSA. I have all kinds of shit. And I always just say it's a medical device. It's a medical device. And then that kind of shuts them up. But um, the reason I do that is because flying is my kryptonite. I mean, that's the thing that devastates me more than anything that I do. And it's really weird because other people get what you call jet lag when they go east I don't have any problem when I go east. I use my human charger. I work out. I get sunlight. I ground. I get in a body of water. I do an ice bath. I do all my shit. I fly to New York. I feel really great the next day. 
every time I fly back to LA, which is heading west, which you're not supposed to get jet lag from, I am a fucking wreck. So I have to take, you know, modafinil. I do all kinds of shit that I'm sure has deuterium and whatever. But, it's tell, not- but tell them now why you know <laughs> you have to do it. Well, you, you well, you're going to have to explain it, but it's it has to do with coming back in this highly uh, conductive ir- irradiated plasma. And conductive field that's LA. Well, I didn't know that. I just know why is it specifically when I fly into LA that I get jacked up? And it's not even crossing time zones because I can fly to Canada west coast and the same shit happens to me when i fly back into la i mean i'm a little worse on a longer flight i think i come back from florida or new york i get tweaked more than say flying back from colorado or Mm -hmm. something but definitely there's something weird going on and so when you said that i was like holy shit yeah so to me it's like the supplements and all the biohacking and stuff yeah i mean if i lived out in nature somewhere i probably wouldn't have to do any of that but honestly i need qualia to make my brain work half the time because i just i know when i feel on point and i know when i don't so, you know, I do things that probably have some negative consequences, but I'm doing it to kind of balance out the scales for the deleterious parts of, of my lifestyle and where I live. Yeah, you got it. the thing is, though, you have to look and see if that trade off is really worth it. And that the problem is, I think up until now, I think 1G to 4G, I think most people who have decent redoxes, they can make it. But this is the time it's going to change. Um, what's going on in Los Angeles is off the chain. I mean, it's just off the chain. And when you see the different pieces and parts, like tomorrow when I give the handout, when I actually get into it, I'm not going to go too terribly detailed into the science because like you said, when when I do do that, people kind of like you lose them at hello. That's why I did a handout. I said, I'm going to tell you what the link is. And then here you go and you can do the homework. But if I was to tell you that broadcast TV telephones, they're all increasing the Van Allen radiation belt. And it all starts from the Los Angeles basin. And it's been going on since the 1960s. Would you believe me? Well, it makes sense. This is the broadcast capital of the world. Well, I'm going to tell but, you. But none of us think about the fact that that could be harmful Not to at biology. All. Well, guess what? Well, there's now documented proof in the federal government at Stanford University that's published that you're going to get tomorrow. So Hollywood is toxic on a number of different metrics. <laughs> this, But this <laughs> is... Hollywood this, is psychologically toxic in many ways. There's some good art coming out of Hollywood, but a lot of it's fucking weird brainwashing controlled by the Chinese and all kinds of weird stuff going on. But on um, on a physical level, too. Oh, it's... Weird, it's, okay. It's, well, this, I wanna, this is the ultimate level. I want to get in, I want to get into that, but I ha- I have a little bit of a linear approach that I want to do, and I want to keep it freestyle. But there are a couple things in my notes I really wanted to cover. First thing is um, going back to your longevity center. Mm-hmm. You said farm, so are you going to have animals or yes. vegetables? Oh yeah, no, we're gonna. It's gonna be. On. It's gonna be full on farm. I mean, it's a ten acre piece of property. It's got all fancy schmancy fences, and, and that's it's in been the, there. It's in the boonies in in Louisiana. Yeah, right? it's on Outside the north shore. It's on the north shore of Louisiana. Yeah, I'm. My front yard is 26 miles of Lake Pontchartrain, so nobody can build anything in front of me. Uh, we have a wildlife reserve around it. Your cell phone hardly works out there. Oh, I love it when my cell phone doesn't work huh. for a number of reasons. Now, something I want to ask you about is I was looking on your Facebook or Instagram or something. It looked like you were doing construction with the building biologist and you know making an EMF proof Faraday kind of room what's up with with that Yeah the clinic itself the the with this two there's three uh buildings on it one is a barn for the animals um then there's a clinic building and then there's my house My house was finished in August so I've been living in the house since that time the house is completely 5G certified and I mean I went through this with a fine tooth comb in fact I had a building biologist come out and actually film the end stages when we were closing up the walls. Oh, cool. To do what we were doing. And I, I took them through the house and showed them all the different things that we did. Uh, because a lot, we went overkill. I put lead line walls like you would get in a hospital in the house. <laughs> oh, damn. And it's, it's really expensive. But the thing is, literally, you could put a fluoro machine outside of my house and it's not getting in. What about the electrical fields? Do you do some kind of shielded yeah, wiring mu- inside the wall? Mu metal. Mu oh. metal covers all the wires. Really? Everywhere. Wow. Yeah. 
So you went to those lengths, even though it's kind of out in the boonies, you're still getting signals out there? I went even further. The whole building, the clinic building, is made out of five-gauge steel. So it's got steel and lead on the inside. The superstructure is all made with pipe from the oil rigs down in Louisiana. You know the BP oil rigs? Wow. Oh, yeah. And it, everything welded together. Everything is made out of metal. The vapor barrier that's supposed to be under the slab, we sit right on the bayou. So the grounding is incredible. In fact, hopefully maybe someday you come visit me. But Matt will tell you, he's been there. I have flagstones in the back. And I had my guy mix up the cement, and we put copper um, oh, dust no in there way. to make more grounding. So when the oh. cathode ray, the sun hits it, you're even getting more effect than you would normally get. Plus, if you go down just 12 inches in my ground, the water table's right there because we're on the bayou. Right. So it's it's when oh, I tell you so it's cool. magical, and the thing that really makes the place magical, if you saw my trees, dude, I have – live oaks on the farm i have about 12 live oaks but the one the two in the backyard are spectacular and i have my 5g warning detection system on the trees you know what that is no you ever see the moss on the the live oak trees yeah yeah that's a fungus and you know that fungus viruses and bacteria all grow with non-native emf so i got the idea to go into the bayou and get the fungus and hang it off my live oaks trees so if they start to grow more than normal, I'm going to know that there's a problem in the environment around there. And that's using nature wow. as your Geiger counter. That is amazing. Yeah, I was um, I was talking to someone about them rolling out. And we're going to get into 5G deeper. But I really want to learn about your center and stuff like that because it's exciting. It's, it's one of my dreams and my vision is to have a home that is safe and mm -hmm. building biologists certified out in the woods somewhere. And like, Well, you're going to have an you know, opportunity. Maybe Maybe this is the place for me to say it. My brother-in-law is now starting a construction company that is going to be building these types of facilities. Oh, amazing, dude. And it's going to be called Alamo Construction. Oh, right? amazing. Alamo's the last stand. Bro. <laughs> oh, that's so dope. So somebody's telling me about uh, in Scottsdale, they're rolling out 5G. And it's interesting, but it's a guy that I interviewed. And he was like, oh, radiation's safe. It's no big deal. And he, he doesn't believe in EMFs being dangerous. Now, I know that, you know, we're... We don't even have to refute that because I know your position. But I told him, I said, well, I just talked to someone who lives in Scottsdale. And you know how they put up the 5G or, you know, all cell towers and there'll be a palm tree. Yeah. Or so that's not so ugly. Cactus, yeah. So they put one up next to two real palm trees. And within weeks, the two fucking palm trees next to it were dead. Right. Dead as a doornail. And mm -hmm. I'm like, that's all I need to know. I don't right. need to understand the science, the biology, the fucking physics. I just know when you have something in nature and it was alive and now it's dead and nothing changed except you put a pole up right there with a bunch of weird frequencies coming off it. So uh, to some people that might seem extreme to build a home that is protected from all this stuff, but to me it seems extreme to not do it that way. Well, I, I'm going to tell you the, the, the project that we did uh, is it's a big project. It's, it's expensive, but I, I talking to my brother-in-law because you know this process has been going on in my head for about ten years. I think you know the 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 trend that you've probably seen out here in L.A. You know the tiny house trend that has become really famous. You know on home and garden TV. I told Steve that I think people would do this, and I think how it's going to start. People are going to do the tiny house maybe in their garage, or they're going to do it in one part of their house. So that way, it's the safe zone, like where they're, they're sleeping. Then I think when they start to see the benefits, then they'll go. Because I think there's going to have to be different price points to do this. Uh, the things that are going to cost the most money are going to be the lead line sheetrock. If you decide to go that route, I don't think you have to, even for 5G. I think 5-gauge steel is all you have to do. I actually think you can even go thinner than that. We're actually talking to a company right now to make the thinnest lead on the market. And I'll, I'll tell you, Luke, when you pick one of these sheets up, a four by eight sheet, I think one of them weighs about 200 pounds. Wow. They're really, really heavy. So they're a pain in the ass to install. Right. So not only do they cost, uh, you know, 20 times as much, like a four by eight sheet for people who are probably wondering is about 20 bucks, you know, regular sheetrock. Our stuff is about 190 bucks for one. So you can see that price point right there is going to jack the price up. If you do installation with electricity, and you guys would probably be interested in hearing this because I haven't really talked about this to anybody, uh, Travis, who's our electrician, 
he, Travis has no experience with EMF. When he came on this project, I said, Travis, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know. And now he's like, he's really all in. He's like, Jack, when you start the classes for the public, can I come? And I said, dude, I expect you to be there because guess what? Some of these people that come that want to talk to an electrician, you've already done a project. You've learned a lot. Like I'm teaching him now how to tell people how to buy light fixtures and lights. And he's, and he said to me, he goes, I would never have thought about doing this as an electrician. And I said, you know, people in your community and my community, they want this service. They want an electrician oh, that they yeah. could talk to and say, yeah, what's the best light for me to buy for this application? You know, given this, that, and that, I said, dude, if you have that ability, I said, those are the things that we're going to be teaching people at the farm. You know, it's not just going to be, you know, a medical center. It's not going to be a place you can get your labs hacked or, you know, come up with the new latest whiz bang or learning how to use light, water, and magnetism, you know, in a clinical setting. It's going to be also about a 5G mitigation center. It's going to be about my kid's depressed. What do I need to do? Um, I told you this earlier. I, I was approached by several people who are CEOs of companies. They wanted me to do a corporate membership where I would agree to come once a year to talk to their people and try to help them all get healthy and then also have a corporate membership for the executives of that committee. I'd never even thought about doing that. People brought this to me and I was like, you know, it's not a bad idea to have maybe a corporate plan. I'm thinking maybe I'll do one or two just to see how it goes because it's not, I was doing this really more for my members. You know, the people that have been with me for 10 years, you know, if they want a piece of me, this is their opportunity to do it. Um, and it, if they don't want it, then I'll open it up to the public and see how it goes from there. The, the, the key thing is I want people to learn what they need to know to protect themselves. Like if, like you said, if you decide, okay, I'm putting my roots down here, I'm not going anywhere else because this is where it's got to be, well, then I'm going to tell you I think you should spend money and build a fortress. Then I think it makes some sense to do that. Yeah. But I think this market is so new it means it's ripe for growth, but it also means it's ripe for marketers who are going to screw people over. And you know how I feel about that. And I think it should be done by people who are in that industry, but also with people who understand the biology behind it and why you're doing what you're doing. And I also think, based on people's price point, you don't have to do all the renovation right off the bat. You can do parts of it and then come back and do the other parts. Wouldn't you want to start with your bedroom? To me, that's well, always... I I would, but you yeah. know, I'll I'll, I'll make you um, give you a better idea. <clears throat> the number one thing is think about where the power lines coming into the house. To me, that's the number one issue, and you know, you have to think about the power company. Um, you know, the the reason why you may like the lead line sheetrock. And I'll give you a couple ideas that I, I've done at the farm. Um, if you have a smart meter and you can't get rid of it because you know there's a lot of places you can't, lead is the perfect solution just in case the fucker. And when you do that, after you have pieces left over from the sheetrock, you peel the lead off and you make the killer cover that's dirt cheap because you already paid for it. And you just bend it because, you know, lead is very moldable. Yeah. And use Gorilla Tape and put it right over the, the outside of the meter. <laughs> nice. nice. It, it works phenomenal. I and bet, and, I the, bet. and the cool thing is, is they don't get any data and they come out and you, I have a sign on mine that says, just slide this right off. And it turns out with the laws where, where we are, if they don't follow the laws, I can have the meter taken out. So they're not fucking with me because they know I'm not playing any games because everybody saw the stuff that we did. So you couldn't we, get an analog meter when you did <clears> a new build? Not not on this Fuck. not in this place. That's crazy. Well, it was one of the things. But it, like I said, when you're faced with a challenge, instead of giving up, I'll think it. And what I decided to do is I encased the whole thing in lead. So it, it, there's no big issue. And what I think is going to happen between me and you, I think the, the meter's going to probably burn out because the radiation can't get out. Right. So I, I think that's... self radiate <laughs> Well, I, I think it probably self radiate itself. Cook itself. I just yeah. hope it doesn't c catch on fire. But I've got... There's no wood in there. It's all metal. Right. So if it burns, even the outside, the outside of the, the house is built with reinforced concrete that's got actually 
metal inside of it. I'm, dude, I went to the <laughs> That's nth degree. Hardcore. I did. I went to the nth That's degree. That's hardcore. What about the uh, the issue of a smart meter creating dirty electricity in the wiring of the house? That's why That's why you have to have a good electrician. Guess what? We were on Travis on that in the beginning, and he didn't know did a lot. Did he fix it? Yeah. Wow. So it, he was able to do quite smart a bit. Smart meters have like a more unregulated, chaotic <laughs> Correct. frequency, right? Yeah, they're yeah. horrible. They're, they're, they work on a lot of the same stuff that Wi-Fi works on. So you have to remember, everybody sets it a little bit differently. But if you have a good electrician, you can get it, you can get it worked out. Cool. So what about, um, it's funny, we're kind of giving the solution before the problem. So this is it good. It's interesting because that's what everyone's know. Oh, my God, this sucks. What am I going to do? So we're giving solutions. So say for someone who lives, you know, I just refuse to leave L.A. because for whatever reason, and I want to make my bedroom, say, a Faraday cage. Would the shielding paint, the grounded shielding paint, I'm and, not a fan. And mesh and stuff. Yeah, keep the, the mesh. I'm a fan out? of. I'm not. Uh, I'm be honest with you. When you test the paint, a the paint is pretty expensive and it's not that good. Really? Yeah. So I'm a much bigger fan. If you really want to go cheap, chicken wire. Really? It works. Holy shit! It does. It for, works e- as even for fi- yeah, even for five G. The key thing so you is you can put it behind your drywall. Yeah, and what you need to do is you can use actually. Don't use the big chicken holes. The smaller the holes are, the better the protection is. So believe it or not, you know the old screening probably when you and I were kids that was made out of metal? Yeah. If you can find that shit, dude. Old window screens? Yeah, it yeah, works. Yeah. It works. Interesting. Okay. Cool. And I, I've checked all this stuff out, and I yeah. decided, did I want to do that? And the reason I didn't do it, I was concerned if we used it and we put, say, a picture in the wall and we popped through the screen, you know, because we like using monkey hooks. Right. It would catch. Oh, right. So you you have to think about stuff like that. And see, the thing I didn't want to do is build something and then have to tear the fucking wall out, you know, because I screwed it up because there's a breach. Right. You see what I'm saying? And then what about the windows? What do you cover the windows? Windows windows are interesting. I made a decision not to go with the EMF glass. And the, the reason why, in my testing, it didn't make that big a difference. And I think part of the reason for that is the location that we're in. Now, there are certain windows that do have it that are faced to certain antennas that I know are in the area. Right now, they're not a problem. Uh, But I still put those special windows in. To be honest with you, the easiest hack for somebody to do is tinfoil right over the window. But what you want light in there, though. Why? Because. Do you want to be inside or should you be outside? (laughs) Well, sometimes you're inside. Ask Matt. Matt's Matt's been to the house. You yeah. don't want to spend any time. Like he came over for Thanksgiving. Yeah. We were in the cold pool for like four or five hours what on about, Thanksgiving uh, Day. What about that fabric they have that it looks like a sheer, you know, kind of Stainless like a, steel. a linen fabric? Uh, we have a couple of- You could tra- use for curtains on right. the windows? We have a couple of transformers that are on the form. What we're doing is we got a stainless steel curtain, putting it over that, and then putting a landscape rock over the top. Oh, interesting. But they do work. They do have those sheared curtains. Not all of them work. Uh, I'd be concerned in this city. And this is probably something, it's a good time to bring this up. When people say 5G, it's not like Wi-Fi that's 2.45 gigahertz. 5G means anywhere from about 6 gigahertz all the way up to 90 gigahertz. The reason why this is going to be a problem for everybody, and you're going to hear about this in my talk tomorrow, is this zip code factor. Meaning that in different locations, in different places, they're going to use different parts of the spectrum between that 6 gigahertz and the 90 gigahertz thing. You heard me mention about what Qualcomm's doing down in San Diego, and your eyeballs got big. Well, not everybody's going to put 60 gigahertz antennas, you know, in different places. Because it turns out, believe it or not, those antennas don't work where there's a lot of trees. So if you have a place that's got a lot of trees, which we have... That's a natural protectant. So I'm going to tell people, if you're going to build a fortress, you should buy a place that's surrounded by trees because that's probably the easiest, cheapest way to do it. You know, cool. buying a, a cool. wooded lot yeah. would be really, really smart. And then the way you clear that lot, you need to think about what you're doing. Right. In terms of the uh, the 5G, uh, how do I want to say this? So you can get an EMF meter that measures radio frequencies, right? And you can tell, you know, where you could come in a hotel. Yeah, like a cornet. Yeah, you could find mm-hmm. your Wi-Fi router. And, you know, you can use that to mitigate if you kind of know what you're doing. Uh, I know I interviewed a guy named Brian Hoyer who's trained by GeoVital in Europe, mm-hmm. like really on-point guy. 
And he's like, you can go buy a, a fucking two hundred dollar meter on Amazon. It's not going to tell you anything. He has about ten grand worth of stuff. You know, mm-hmm. different one for magnetic, different one for electric. All the stuff, super legit. But I think you were mentioning that to actually measure five G accurately, the device that does that is about a hundred grand. Well, it it was when we started doing it. It was one hundred eight thousand dollars to be exact. Um, there's now meters out. The price is about thirty five thousand euro. So you have to do the conversion. So are the other are the other um, meters useful at all in no. detecting five G? No, and that remember what I said to you earlier. I think your members will be interested in hearing this. When the public or media comes out and says, "Oh, your city's going five G," that means that it's been five G for three or four years before because they've been testing it. Right. And the thing is. The reason why they don't have to tell anybody is because nobody has the meters. And this is what you need to do when you're here in L.A. Go talk to the Verizon guys and the AT&T guys. They, don't, they don't, will not even allow them to have meters on them to test anything. So they have no idea what they're around, even when they fix these arrays. That's, wow. That'll show you just how, how sinister this is because they know they just don't want any data. You know, it's kind of like if they had this data – Eventually, when it turns like the cigarette stuff turned with uh, big tobacco, this is going to be the biggest lawsuit in the history of lawsuits. I mean, it's now everybody now knows with the NTP study just coming out a month ago. Everybody now knows that what I've been saying is it's not bullshit. It's for real. And they don't really know how for real it is because I don't think they people really understand the NTP study and really what it found. What well, is the NTP study and what is well, it? The federal government started the study about 10 years ago, but it got really serious when the first set of data came out in 2015 and it was called preliminary. But what it showed is that nocturnal animals got different types of cancers, all different kinds. Well, when the government paid that $25 million, they didn't expect this result. Okay. So they shelved it and went back to study. They sent it back to the scientist. The scientist just released the study final tally beyond a shadow of a doubt emf causes cancer no doubt about it in lab animals now you'll see a lot of you know talk from different outlets where oh that's not really what it said everybody's trying to put their spin on it oh we need more study that's the key that the ctia is going to want people to do those are the cell carrier you know guild um we don't need any more study in fact this ntp study is devastating it's devastating because nocturnal animals, their melanopsin system, which is what a, the blue light detector is in your skin, is uh, bound to this other vitamin called vitamin A. And it has a loose covalent bond in humans. Well, it turns out in a- animals that they tested, that they have a strong covalent bond because they're nocturnal. So if it caused cancer in them, and what you don't know is they only check this on 1G and 2G animals. What you think is going to happen Whoa. with 5G, bro? That's what I'm saying. So the issue with 5G is that it's a more dangerous frequency range? Well, it, it's a lot of different things. It's the way it's been engineered. And so the waveform is different. It's totally alien because it's artificial and man-made. But it's also the frequency is a problem because what do microwaves do? They rotate bonds. Well, what did I just tell you about melanopsin in us to vitamin A? It's a weak covalent bond. So that means if you rotate it too much, you just created the same effect that blue light does. Well, it turns out if we didn't have melanopsin on our skin, it wouldn't be a big deal. What did I tell you earlier today? That 5G jump conducts on insulators and conductors. Guess what your skin is? It's an insulator and a conductor. And guess where melanopsin is now? It's in your skin. Jump conductor meaning that frequency it goes, literally gets it go, on you and yeah. uses you as an antenna, basically. You got it. What the fuck? Yeah, and your skin happens uh. to be the the most conductive element in your body, and it turns. It also turns out it's the largest one in your body, and it turns out that's where melanopsin is. So when you begin to understand the, the head-splitting stuff that I talk about, like that melanopsin and all the chromophores in your body are topologic insulators, This basically is an Intel chip, except that God or nature made that's designed to be hydrated and the electromagnetic radiation affects the water. The water changes its topology, meaning 
the hydrogen bonding network around it, and that gives the instructions of what the protein's supposed to do. That's how we really work. The water in us. Correct. Like metabolic water? Yeah. Talk okay. about water that your mitochondria yeah. makes. Yeah. The key is the instructions come from the light. That's how everything goes. Well, what happens when you have an alien light form that interrupts that photonic signal? All hell's going to break loose. And here's the real interesting part. I told you that that frequency range goes from 6 gigahertz to 90. That means that we're going to see variable effects in different cities based on what they're using. L.A. is not using what Austin's doing. L.A. is not using what New York's doing. Why? Because the topology of the landscape is different, and you don't know that. Oh, and, and right. And doctors are not right, going to know that. Right, depending on how flat it is, altitude. All different kinds land of things. Land masses some, in the some, way, Sometimes like it's like buildings in New York. So if you look at it, there's another issue that I've already shared with my members, but I, I don't think I've actually shared it on your page or with anybody uh, in your in your world. But the other big issue with uh, 5G, I just blanked on it. I had it in my mind. New York? Yeah. Did it have something to do with New York? It was. It's probably because we're in a 5G field right now. <laughs> also could be because I've been, I've been awake all day. And, Dude, and they came you out flew of surgery. today too, Yeah, huh? I did. Oh, uh, my God. If I had flown into LAX today, I'd be floored. I can't, I can't do anything. Well, I forgot what I was It's say. okay. It'll come back to you. So, okay. With the 5G thing, there's another interesting thing that I've noticed about it. And as you said, you know, I'm just, I'm a guy that hates being fucking lied to, especially by government agencies that I'm paying. And so as I started to look into more of the political aspects of 5G and seeing that how it works is that the big telecommunications giants, these multinational corporations that control the fucking world and everything in it and on it, uh, what they do is they'll go to local governments for a town or a city, and they'll pay that local government to lease every phone pole, uh, power pole, yeah, and you know, government buildings, etc. And so, local communities and local governments are incentivized by the cash that they're going to get, you know. And when you're talking about California that manages its money very poorly. Mm -hmm. uh, cities that are mismanaged are much more susceptible to selling out and kind of ignoring the data and ignoring the health risks of the public because they want that money. I think I think all cities in the United States are mismanaged, to be quite frank with right. you. So I think the real problem, the way you really have to think about 5G is population density. And I just thought about what I was going to say because um, this is important. It's really important for you to hear. Uh, what most people don't know is the federal government owns most of the western half of the United States. So that means the way 5G is going to be rolled out there is going to be radically different than what's going to happen in New York. So the reason why I need you to think about this, we were talking before about building biology and things like that. Since the federal government owns almost everything west of the continental divide, Elon Musk is a big player in their plans. It's going to come from above. So that means the way you need to build needs to be different than the way people are going to build other places. Just so you know, the federal government only owns about 3% of the land east of the Mississippi. So they have no control over there. So the rollout for 5G on the east coast and the west coast can be radically different. And people are not thinking about this. I will even tell you, in jurisdictions, and that's what got me thinking about it when you started talking about cities, jurisdictions are also going to put their stamp on this. You know, Just like you have federal, state, and local, it's going to be the same way. So in other words... There's going to be places that get their special version of 5G, and that special version may lead to different variable results. Why am I concerned about this, and why do I want to share this with you? Because when this gets rolled out and it's in cities, they're going to say, well, look, this has happened in L.A., but it's not happening in New York. And the cell company's going to say, well, it's, it's, it's got to be a linear effect. Well, they, they know damn well that 5G and everything in the electromagnetic spectrum works in a nonlinear fashion. But that's, that's not how medicine works. See, we look at cause and effect, and it turns out in quantum mechanics, there really is no cause and effect. It's called probabilistic mechanics. That's, that's the nature why when you learn this stuff, it blows your mind. You're like, I, this doesn't make any sense to me, you know, how, how something can be in superposition and this and that. That's how it works. And the thing is, you don't try to understand nature just realize that she is more bizarre than any mistress you could have ever brought to the dance and the crazy thing is i think this is going to have a huge effect on different cities when we start seeing the aftermarket data roll in where 
cities are going to have different problems. Like you're going to see autoimmunity in one place. You're going to see cancer in the other place. Another place you're going to see people at EHS. And people are going to use that variability to try to continue radiating people. And we need to be aware that this is going on. I think the thing that's going to probably save most people, um, and I haven't really talked about this too much publicly. My members know about it. But we've had data for about 12 years in medicine that's very unusual that nobody talks about. And we have these conferences called M&M conferences. And in these conferences, we talk about zip codes where sicker people tend to live. The, doc, the hospitals and the doctors, they haven't put two and two together yet. Turns out that the zip code problem is related to the radiation problem. So we can predict who's going to stay in ICU longer based on where their zip code is. Wow. And the hospitals know this wow. data, but they're not sharing it with anybody. But doctors know about it. And I'm sure there's going to be some doctors listening to this and they're going to go, so that's what it means. Because I can tell you just about every hospital I've been in the last 10 years – I've known about this, and I don't talk about it even there because I think they would become very suspicious. Um, and this this is the inflection point. I've decided to talk about it publicly now because I think we're really going to see it. And it's already started. You know in L.A., uh, th this is one of the things that's near and dear to my heart. You know, Matt started his podcast you know, with Rick Rubin, and, and you know, the first one we did up in Vermont was to talk about all the people in the music industry that were killing themselves. Well, here's the real one that I'm worried about, because this one is definitely related to technology, is the number one death between 15 and 25 right now in the United States is suicide. And people don't realize the number one effect, the cause of depression, is usually from the inability to make dopamine. This is going to be a huge 5G spike. Like tomorrow... I'm going to show you all the, the different disease spikes and how they occur, and I'm going to put predictions up that I made to my members for the last seven, eight years, and I'm not going to use the science. I'm just going to show you the current events that have been out there, and I'm going to tell you the links. You heard one of the links today yeah. that blew your mind. Crazy, dude. About two people that you know, well-known people that everybody even know, but I knew something before anybody else did, and I made a prediction, and I told one of my members, didn't I? I said, you need to sell these buildings. And sure shit, within four months, two famous people killed themselves who lived in those buildings. This is the kind of stuff that people need to know is coming. And the thing is, <clears throat> it may not make no sense to you right now, but the best advice that I can give anybody listening to this, I want you to watch the TV. I want you to watch the computer. I want you to watch Twitter. I want you to watch current events. Because you're going to see some really bizarre stuff happen. I personally believe even some of the, the things in our politics in the last two or three years, especially the difference between New York and California and where I live, I believe it's an effective 5G. I really do. People being so nuts. Well, not only so nuts, I also think that I, and th this, may, this may be hyperbolic for some people to hear. I believe there's a reason people vote the way they do. And I believe... It's arc orchestrated by what we're doing. And the reason I say that, so for people who are listening to this, their eyeballs probably got big like yours did. <laughs> You're watching my body language. Right. I'm like, okay, where's this going? Well, I'm gonna I love this shit. I'm going to tell you where it is going. There's a guy, a, a guy named Dr. Delgado, who did the original studies on bulls. And he hooked the uh, wired devices up into the bull's head and, you know, had the bull charge after the guy, the bullfighter. And they flipped the switch and the bull stopped. And this guy did all these studies for the federal government in the 60s and 70s. And all of a sudden it went away. It was called Project Pandora. Well, here was the interesting thing. Delgado, before he went, you know, black, black and dark, um, he did this wirelessly. And it turned out from that technology, guess who owns the patents for all this stuff now? The social media empire, Google and all that. You can do it through blue light. And the way you do it is you control people's dopamine level. So now you may be starting to understand why Jack's such a stickler about some of this stuff. Like you want to put on my head and this and that. Because the one thing that I think you know about me already is I'm a pretty thoughtful guy. I, I tend to think about things a lot differently than other people because I go deeper. And 
when I started to put all this stuff together, I started to look at who owned the patents for blue light technology through screens. Like it makes no sense when you think about it. We're sitting in front of a red light now. I mean, everybody and their grandmother knows that blue light's now a problem. Well, five or six years ago, they didn't. I was talking about it 15 years ago. And the reason why is what I'm telling you right now. I knew about Delgado studies and I knew that the social media giants owned the patents. They went and bought the patents. Like Google owns this. Facebook owns this. And when you start to see some of the things that are coming out in LA right now uh, about Facebook, that it's addictive, you know, people think it's hyperbolic, but if you understand what I'm saying right now, I'm telling you it's not. And what's the link to the to political arena? What just happened, Luke, two years ago? We had a presidential election that was running fake ads on Facebook and all kinds of other things. Why do you think those things happen? I think this was a test case to see if they could get an election go the way they wanted it to go. I really believe it. And the reason I believe it is not because I'm a conspiracy theorist guy. I'm telling you that they are honing in on how to use light to control people's behavior. And I think it's one of the reasons why there's a big push in New York and California why everybody wants guns taken away. Why? Well, if you disarm the electorate and people find out about this, you know, in the history of our country, we tend not to like things like that. And I think that's really what's going on. I think that's the undertone of most of the things that are going on with our president, with the Democrats fighting tooth and nail. I think it's a huge problem. And I think a lot of this stuff is going to get uncovered in the next 15 or 20 years. I don't think it's hyperbolic at all. And if you ha you have to look back to understanding about what that 1996 FCC law said, um, it basically at the last moment, and it turns out it happened to be my congressman that did this when I was in residency, Billy Tozan. He basically gave him carte blanche. We're not allowed to go back and solve, uh, you know, solve for X or sue them, even if we find out in the future that this causes a problem. So if you think about that. You mentioned it before, and I thought you were going to go there. We're talking about the FCC auction process. Well, who, who sets that up, Luke? It's the freaking federal government. That's who sells it to CTIA. Who gets that money? The federal government. So who's got skin in the game? It's them. And they're the ones that are also responsible for protecting the populace from danger. <laughs> Think about it. So it's, so it's, oh, the, it's the wolf yeah. controlling the hen house. And the thing is... When you see these links put together, then all of a sudden you say, you know, this this isn't too far fetched. Actually, this actually makes a lot of sense. And you start thinking about Jesus, this really is a brave new world. And it kinda is. And the thing is, that's the reason why I have such a big disdain for social media, because I know what its real purpose is. It's not what I use it for. I told you today one of the best things about social media is blocking people. I, I would agree. It's fun. It is. Yeah. And and the thing the thing the thing that's it's fun because it's 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 great to have at least one area of your life where you can omit negativity. I uh, I I have another thing too. I think when I block you on social media it also means you're blocked in real life too. I have no interest in in having a relationship with anybody who thinks they can control the narrative of anything between me and them through a screen. It's just ridiculous. Uh but the reason I bring it up, because um, I'm not trying to make a joke of this, I'm trying to tell you that's one of the effects that I think people need to realize. It's amazing to me how nasty people get on social media, and it's because of the blue light. It's because of the non-native EMF. Your behavior is being controlled, and you don't realize it. It's trying to keep you addicted to this technology. And because I, of the effects on your neurotransmitters. on Specifically dopamine. Right. The dopamine network is the big one, and it starts in your eye, goes through your optic nerves, screws with your circadian mechanism, goes into your frontal lobes, and then into your brainstem. And don't, doesn't the actual hardware of the technology put in a light with a very specific flicker rate to hypnotize you? Correct. Uh, th and that's those, verified. I mean, a lot of this stuff, to some people, is going to sound like conspiracy theories, but some conspiracies aren't theories. Some of them are the way things fucking are. Right. And I hate to say it, but you know, this use... As I look at my phone to check my notes for the interview. <laughs> the, the wireless use of light to do this all stems back from Delgado's studies. 
And the thing is, he realized, he was the first scientist that realized, if I could control a bull's behavior with wires, why couldn't I do it with light? And the reason why, if you think about it, what's electricity? It's, an, it's a plasma. Well, what is light? It's also a plasma. It's a conductive plasma that happens to oscillate orthogonally electric and magnetic field. You know, that's the physics way of looking at it. But it's really just another form of energy. Well, if you can figure out how to harness it, and I personally believe that the federal government for about 40 years has been trying to figure out how to harness it. And I think that's what has been going on the last 20, 25 years. That's the reason why Obama pushed so hard to have the Internet of Things because what's let's talk about what 5G really is. It's to fucking connect everything together. Like who the fuck needs their washing machine, you know, to answer their cell phone? Right. But when you put these RFID chips in everything, everything talks to each other, you become a surveillance state. I mean, yeah. look at what's going on in China right now. Yeah. They have this face recognition technology. Like, if you don't pay your parking ticket, they shame you. Social score. Yeah. It's, 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 it's beyond Orwellian. Or, Orwell was lightweight compared to and that's, the way things are going. And, that, and that's the, I mean, honestly. That's, I'm sure there's probably some people going to be watching this or listening to this, and they're going to go, there's no way. And the thing is, you and I are sitting here... As older guys, like most of the people that probably follow us are younger, they don't, they, they've never had the experience you and I have had when we got to grow up and play outside. These kids are on the phone immediately. They don't realize how controlled they are. I mean, there was just a study that came out. You, they asked college students to pick between food and their phone, and they picked the fucking phone. I mean, think about that. Wow. That, if that's not an addiction, nothing yeah. is. And the problem oh, is... I'm, I I've shared on this show in interviews and, and solo shows that, you know, I've beat, as I said earlier, a lot of addictions. I'm very grateful for that. And, and, and you know, and that cigarettes and pornography and all kinds of other shit, too, dopamine-related addictions. Mm -hmm. But this goddamn phone, dude, to get me to leave it in the other room for 15 minutes is a miracle. I mean, mm -hmm. I cannot be away from it. And it well, bothers me because I know what it but, feels like to be controlled and addicted, and it's irritating to me that I'm gonna it's tell got you, me. I'm going to tell you, though, that this is exactly the same as heroin, and, and this is what you need to understand. <clears throat> Drugs and light oscillate at a frequency, and that's the way you need to think about it. When you think about it in those terms and see, look, yeah, I want you to, I want you to, to feel this. This is good when you get the cut on your lip because I know how you feel about the other stuff that you did. But I want you to realize that this is not that far off base. And in fact, this is the most insidious drug. Why? Because it's happening at a level so below your perception. Technically, this is occurring below the molecular level. But it's absolutely, this is how nature controls the things in us. So you, we are now fucking with the major things. And I want people to understand this perspective that we're talking about because then they'll begin to understand why I'm such a stickler about these things. Because when you realize the things that we're talking about here and you start to extrapolate them through all the different things that we do, you start to go, whoa, this, this, is, this is way beyond what I thought. You know? And people think it's, it's not real. I think you need to start paying attention. Put some Windex on your glass eye. Uh, it's happening with kids. I mean, kids right now, they're controlled by TVs and computers routinely. I mean, you can go out yeah. right now. If we all went right now to a museum, probably in L.A., I guarantee if we found a, a, a group of teenagers, they'd all be down at their phone. they actually text each other without talking to each other, and they'd be in the same group. I can, I can tell you. I've seen it. It happened. I just took my old scrub tech from Nashville. came to see me yesterday in um at the farm and she brought her three boys they're all big into gym gymnasts and and tumbling and shit and i took them out to dinner and they were all on the fucking phone texting each other and they're sitting right next to each other and i'm going are you fucking kidding me <laughs> maybe yeah. they were doing it to talk shit privately <laughs> well i don't i don't grown-ups are so annoying i know man actually i don't think they were because the the thing is the kids were all fascinated by the light i was teaching them about red light because they they wanted to talk about recovery you know because they're all elite athletes i right, mean right. her son is really really good like apparently his instagram is like amazing his name is uh if anybody want to look him up stone uh he is fucking amazing 
Stone Stone is his name. Stone Stone? Dude, just um, look him up on he, Instagram. He You're won in a Inst- lottery of names. No, but they did it on purpose, but this kid is an amazing tumbler. I'm, I'm not kidding you. For the time he's a kid, but he's really, really good, and he's going to a, a – um, championship i think in houston that's where they were driving to but i talked to the kids about what was going on in their world and they told me all of them like my friends they're totally addicted wow they would all pick their phones that none of the kids are sleeping either that's that's the real concern like i talked to stone i talked to my own kids my daughter told me this two years ago this really bothered me one of her best friends in high school, used to sleep with the iPhone under the pillow. Oh. Well, guess what? The kid wound up dropping out of school. My daughter no longer is friends with her. I, I don't, will not let her hang out with her anymore. And the reason why, this kid's personality has changed. Like, so I knew this kid when the kid was normal. Now the child's brain has changed. And now we know, Luke, how this happens. You're going to hear about this tomorrow at my talk. But I'm going to share with you how I made this prediction. I made this prediction in 2011. <clears throat> Remember the two astronauts, the two brothers, the Kellys? Mm-mm. Two astronauts, identical twins. One went up to space, one didn't. They started talking about doing this experiment in 2011. So I made the prediction to my members. I said, if they do this and keep one guy on the ground and put one guy up, the guy that goes up is going to get hypermethylated. His DNA is going to become hypermethylated. Remember... The only thing that changed is the environment. And I warned all my members that when he goes up to space, that's going to mimic a 5G world. Why? Everything in the ISS is 5G. It's all blue lit, all the communication stuff. He was only up there for 340 days. In the craft you're talking about. In the ISS. And Scott Kelly came back. It was last year, and all the papers are out. He's hypermethylated. Wow. So how did Jack know? Well, guess what? melanopsin dysfunction causes hypermethylation. Why? Because it destroys the photoreceptors in your body. What's the number one photoreceptor that the vegans need to pay attention to? B12. B12 acts as a photoreceptor in humans. That's interesting. I just got my labs done and my B12 was low. I'm like, what the hell? I ate a lot of red meat. LA. Wow. Now you know why. (laughs) And see, this is the thing. that You're getting a little... Um, slice of what the farm is going to be like. So when you bring my labs and we sit down and we have this kind of conversation and I know a lot more about Luke, then I can say, Luke, this is serious. You, you need to really think about what's going on. Well, the crazy thing with the two astronauts is we've been seeing this effect in cosmonauts and astronauts. So I tell all my members, pay attention to what happens in space because it's going to be what's going to happen on the surface of the planet when 5G goes live. Do you think that the radio frequencies that are now so abundant have anything to do with why the Earth's natural magnetic field has gone down? Or do you just think that's just how the universe works and we're in a cycle where the magnetic field, you know, the axis is shifting, whatever's happening, and it just got lower? I'm going to tell you, I think... Right now, based on what I know, I think it's the natural cycle, but you opened up a can of worms that I love. Do I believe that the sun and the earth communicate through the solar wind? I do. And do I believe that the effect that we've had on electromagnetic pollution has affected this current solar cycle? I do believe that. And the reason I believe that is for what I told you earlier tonight that there's now documented proof that radio frequencies that man has used for the last, I guess since 1940, because that's when we first put radar up after the Japs bombed us, uh, has created a third Van Allen belt. And What's that, a Van Allen belt? Van Allen belt are the radiation belts that are part of the magnetosphere oh, uh, around the Earth. That are natural. Right, they're natural. Yeah. Well, it turns out the third one isn't. It's man-made. Oh, my and, God. And the <laughs> Navy, the Navy has documented... That it's been expanding and expanding as we've used technology. And it turns out there's a theory out there. And you guys can look this up. It's called Broadcast Theory. they got a great website. I've been following for over 10 years. And I never really talked about this stuff publicly because I wasn't sure that it was for real. After that, I looked at the physics. I was like, "This this is for real. VHF and UHF, 
RF radiation can cause this. When the NTP st study came out, that's when I felt a little bit more compelled to step my game up and tell you about this. The reason why I've always been on your ass about LA is because of this issue, because of the broadcast. It's also the reason I told you about the aura ring. Anything that makes RF, you got to be really concerned about. Well, what happens as this belt gets bigger? It actually changes global temperature. So guess what? Now it seems like Jack keeps going from conspiracy theory to conspiracy theory. And guess what I'm trying to explain to you, Luke? You know about the butterfly effect, right? No. Butterfly effect is a weather effect. That's where it was first described by a guy named Dr. Lorenz in the 1960s. In the famous paper that he wrote, he said, can a butterfly's wings in Brazil cause a tornado somewhere else? And it turns out in climate science, that's where we first found out the true nonlinear effects of climate. And it, and it is true. So you'll be shocked to hear this. A guy named Svenmark in... I guess it was in Denmark or maybe Norway. He's a, you know, a Scandinavian guy. He found in 1997 that when the Earth's magnetic field drops, more cosmic radiation comes in, and that's how clouds are made. So if you start noticing, all the people that live at high latitudes, I don't know if you saw, Toronto just set a record for the most cloudy days in November. And they talked about it. It was on social media. That's one of the effects of the magnetic field when the magnetic field of the sun reduces that reduces the heliopause which controls all the planets where the third anode from there what you said and smiled you notice i didn't smile i believe it actually is very plausible the physics are there do i believe man can change the connection between the sun and the earth i do now i didn't 10 years ago but I do now. And do I believe that some of the crazy weather that we're seeing all around, along the planet is tied to the science that we are talking about now? Yes. That's why Jack is not a believer in the CO2. I, I do not believe in that curve. Uh, thermodynamically, it makes no sense at all. If, if you believe the CO2 story that you're being sold... You mean from cars and cows farting and yeah, stuff? Yeah, all, all that stuff. But even yeah. from us burning like coal... It, to believe that would be to believe that I could fill up the bathtub right now and put a heater in there and raise the temperature of the water. It's just total bullshit. Thermodynamically, it makes no sense at all. But how, what do we hear from the left specifically? Oh, well, there's a consensus in science. L Luke, tell me what consensus in science means. Consensus is actually a pseudoscientific point. Science, there should be no consensus. Everybody should question everything. You know, right, it should right. be anti-consensus. <laughs> right, right. But you hear this and you go, why do we have this narrative? Again, we're back well, to... Well, I saw, I saw a documentary years ago called The Great Global Warming Swindle. And it was full of a lot of very intelligent scientists that refuted uh, strongly, based mm -hmm. on actual science, mm -hmm. that the warming of the planet has been happening for eons and it's just what happens the planet gets warm the planet gets cold we go through ice ages we go through periods in which the planet gets hot and and that they surmise that what it was really all about is more taxation it's a globalist agenda no it's it's a wallet tax. bobsy it's it's a hidden another hidden tax mm -hmm. to charge uh, energy companies and and producers of oil essentially, and users of oil products, uh, more tax. Mm -hmm. And you get people like me that I care about the environment, dude. Like, I, I don't litter. I mean, I don't spit fucking gum on the street. That's just how I was raised. I love nature. And so I'm someone that's been kind of perplexed by these issues. I don't get involved politically, but I observe kind of both sides. And I'm like, mm, if you're talking about government agencies unifying to control the people and to extract more money from them, and that's what that's the, the most that's, of, a, that's a plausible of sa to save the environment. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, can't we do it without charging people more hidden tax though? You know, right. so I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but it's interesting to look at all sides of things, and that's just the way I try to be open minded and look at all things. But what makes sense from what you're talking about is this third belt of all this ionizing radiation that's it's, being it's created. Ha it's having a, a huge effect on climate. That actually makes sense to me. Yeah. Well, the thing is, though, I was really surprised when the Navy admitted that their RF 
radiation was being held in. And this is the point that I want to make to you. <clears throat> this third belt, what's its real problem? What's its effect? Long time ago, seven, eight years ago, when I first got big on social media, I made the comment in several podcasts that a lot of the radiation that we're creating can't get out into space. That was always not true. When we only had two belts, you could get out. The third belt keeps it in. Doesn't that sound a little bit like a microwave oven? Wow, interesting. So guess what? So does our atmosphere act as a Faraday cage that sort it of is, holds cause in cause all it, of the radiation that we're producing? It's a plasma. Think about think about oh what happens God, that's crazy. when the solar wind comes in. Remember, it's got all all parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, but it knocks out most of the bad stuff. Well, it turns out the sun's magnetic field controls the radiation that gets in. More cosmic radiation gets in, and that's how we form clouds. So what does that do? It acts to cool the earth down. Okay, that's how it works. That's what a maunder minimum is. And we we kind of know a little bit about the maunder minimum because it happened, you know, not that long ago. We've got a lot of good photosynthetic data on it. What we know is there's a solar cycle that's 11 years. Right before you get a maunder minimum, what happens? That cycle increases by about to about 13 years and it happens several times. Then all of a sudden you'll go through a period of like 60 to 80 or 100 years where like rivers froze. So like so back in the 1700s, there's literature out there that the Thames River and the Seine River in, in Paris and in England was completely frozen for like 40 or 50 years. Wow. And Well, that's what's interesting right now in looking at, you know, and again, I don't, I'm not knowledgeable enough about this stuff to form a real opinion, but I do observe. But what I observe is like, I see reports, record low temperatures. There's record low temperatures all around and shit's freezing that's never been frozen or it's been hundreds mm -hmm. or thousands of years. And I'm like, wait, I thought the planet's supposed to be getting hotter. And if I mention that to people who are sort of part of the mainstream paradigm of mm -hmm. global warming, et cetera, they say, it's not global warming, it's climate change. Right. Well, you know and why they're like saying the that? that's way out of that sort right, of because, because argument. That, but it's kind of like what I told the guys when we had the Q&A downstairs. If you can't explain it, it's pseudoscience. <laughs> and and, peop, and they can't explain it. So what do they do? They just create another narrative. Why does the narrative work? It goes back to the other discussion we just had. Because everybody's blue light toxic. So their dopamine level's so low, they don't even know what to fucking ask. <laughs> wow. I'm serious. I mean, when oh, you really crazy. see all the parts, the right. moving parts together, you know, it's like that, that scene in Da Vinci Code. You know, when everything is mixed together, you're like, you got to be fucking kidding me. So these these are the wars that we see um, on Twitter. It's like everyone's get tr trashing their dopamine from looking at the blue light and the flick light, fr flicker rate on their phone, and then forming in a pseudo intellectual, emotionally charged argument and having all of these mind games and ego games. But they don't know that, or they, I'm sure I've engaged in these things too, to a degree. We don't know that we're actually victims. Of the technology and that's what's and that's actually the data that they're trying to harness they're trying right. to figure out exactly what it is how you can control large groups of people by doing this that's i think what the real end game of social media is and i think at least since i've been on social media um let's just say i'm assuming that i'm correct in what i just told you my end game the way i use social media is radically different than what everybody else does I'm not using it for the reasons everybody else is. I'm using it because I'm actually looking to see who's afflicted and who's not. And I eliminate those who are afflicted. And the, and I want the people who aren't to be black swans. And the reason why, I'm not for everybody, but everybody's not for me either. And the, the key thing is I need people to really understand, to look down at the core levels of issues if we're really going to solve this problem that we've got, we need some bright people that are open-minded, that are willing to ask questions that other people don't even ponder. And one of the things about having a low dopamine state is when it's that bad, you're not going to ask those questions. I mean, just think about, I mean, you can talk to this point probably better than anybody. When you were a drug addict, how was your decision-making? Well, it's motivated by one thing and one thing only. How can you get well? Well, guess what? 
you have a sense of dis-ease and you know there's one thing or uh, multiple things, you know, in a powder or pill form or whatever that can fix it real quick. Well, guess what? Kids have the same sense all, if you take their phone away. That's why they go fucking crazy. Yeah. And I, people I, don't funny, see gonna, it. I'm going to interview Neil tomorrow about parenting, conscious parenting, and I'm, I'm curious to see because I think his kid's two or three or something. I'm curious to see how he's dealing with that. And I, I know parents that are pretty conscious and they limit screen time and they have hours their kids can use the phone or video games. I, I don't think kids should be able to use a phone until they're at least 20, 25 years old. Wow. The reason why is because the methylation in their brain. What I, t- what I just tell you before about the astronauts. <laughs> I'm going to be a bad parent then. <laughs> it's like, uh, how, can you, I mean, how, how can you even have a kid and explain to them that it's for their own good when all of their friends have? I'm going to show you a picture tomorrow that it's going to be easy to explain it. I'm going to show okay. you an unmyelinated brain and a myelinated brain just from B12. Wow, because the blue light destroys your B12. Well, not only the blue light. It used to be just blue light. Now it's all the non-native EMF. And what am I telling you? The non-native EMF is far worse. Right. And and that's the one that's growing. Remember, right. blue light is static. I mean, you just put it on. All all the tech screens use it, you know. But you can. There's ways to hack it. I mean, we're hacking yeah. it right now by having the red light on. Yeah. But there's really no way to turn off the internet signal if you right. want to be on the internet. Right. And see, that's what you've got to realize. You got to you got to realize how insidious this game really is that we're playing. So. I've said on several podcasts, I haven't said it on yours, but I'll say it now because it's important. I think if you give your kid any technology before their brain's smiling, it's akin to taking them to Walmart and kicking the living shit out of them in front of an audience. And and it's not hyperbole anymore. Jack has got serious whoopee-doo science behind him. When your brain is hypermethylated, you can't make myelin. Okay? You know one of those diseases called MS. That should, everybody who's got MS that just heard that said, wait a minute, is, is Terry Walls really white? Is it minding your mitochondria and eating leafy vegetables? No, it's non-native EMF. That's the real problem. That's the reason why when you go away from the equator, the redox drops, that's the link to, to MS. And the thing is, we're seeing it now in vegans. I'm going to show you a picture tomorrow of one country because, you know, Jack loves to get his points across very clearly. I'm going to take you to India, where most vegans are, below a latitude line. I'm going to draw the line for you, okay? These people have been vegan for 5,000 years. Why is it? Vegetarian. A lot of vegans eat cheese and ghee and stuff. Right, right. Vegetarian or, or vegan. These people in this country have done this for 5,000 years. Why is it that Jack made a prediction that they would lead the world in, a, in diabetes and obesity? 2015, do you know how many people where the leader was in the world? India, below that latitude line. Guess what it is in 2017? 72 million people. Wow. Guess what it's going to be in 2019? 100 million people. So when you hear people that are vegans out there in social media or like some of the guys that we heard here, and they tell you that it's a really healthy thing, Jack goes straight to the place where there's more vegans on the planet and says, explain. And guess what? Do you, know, do you know where that latitude line is? It's the Tropic of, of Cancer to the equator. There's every, everybody in that p- country is a vegetarian. Above that line, because the Himalaya Mountains are there, they all eat meat. Interesting, right? Because so they Jack, have to, because right. they can't farm up there. Exactly. Yeah. So Jack goes to where humans have a 5,000-year history. So if the vegans and vegetarians in the United States – are correct about the narrative that these people are healthier. Explain this situation. I'm going to tell you what the answer is. What do you know also about that line? Bangalore and Mumbai. What do you know about California? Every single company that you call for tech support is there. They created Silicon Valley in the middle of vegan world. And guess what happened? Dude, this is the best podcast ever. This shit is blowing my mind. We got three dudes. Pa- oh, okay, two of them were awake. Maddie's passed out. But this is this is this is what I'm explaining to you right now. This is what nonlinear effects are. What does nonlinear effects mean for your non-scientific audience? Because this is a really important point. Small stimulus leads to massive amplification. So what did I just tell you? Since 
we turn the Indian economy on to technology and they're vegans, they're fucking getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Stop for a moment. What did Jack just tell you is coming to California's vegan community? Understand? Why, why do we have so many fucking crazy people out in California now? What's the narrative and trend out here? Do you understand what I'm saying? If your brain doesn't work, and remember, we're humans. We bury all of our mitochondria here in our heart. If you have an active process going on that's hypermethylating you, destroying your photoreceptors, not allowing you to myelinate, can you think? Are you more likely to be controlled? The answer is right. yes. Right. This is a giant... Being, or, being manipulated by a narrative that wants to be pushed by the powers that be. And the crazy part of this grand scheme that I think is going on is all the disease epidemics that you see today. Suicide, opiates, obesity, autoimmunity. These are the collateral effects of this experiment that's going on. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned India because I spent some time there actually in southern India, Bangalore and Chennai and mm -hmm. all across that, that lower um, southern region of India. And it's interesting because I saw very few healthy looking people. <laughs> people are like little kids are fat, you mm -hmm. know, and I was like, oh, this is weird. And you never see anyone really um, that's kind of fit and ripped and muscular and looking healthy. That's, and I, that's, thought, that's I thought part, that was interesting. That's part of the I was a vegetarian at the time. No. And I was like, oh, this is great. I get vegetarian food everywhere. Well, I mean, <laughs> it, it's kind of for me, I when I want to understand something, I go to the source, and there's no better source on the planet for vegans and vegetarians than India. I mean, it's, it's perfect. And when you look at the latitude, you just draw that line between the 20th. The equator's past the tip of Sri Lanka. But the entire country where vegans live is in strong solar light. Do you want to know how you can be vegan and vegetarian in Jack's world of understanding? If you live in the tropics, it's the ideal place for you to be vegan. The problem is... With technology, it's effectively taken their habitat away. That's what technology has done to vegans and, and vegetarians. So if you're in a tech world and you're eating like a rabbit, what is Jack predicting? Well, let's talk about the lady in New York City, Kate Spade. Did you know she was a vegan? Did you know where she lived, right? Right where they put those big microwave antennas on her house year before so why did jack say what he said was coming what happened to her yeah she peaced out so guess what God rest her soul yeah well i think i think when people start to put two and two together and that's the real key this this is going to be a really tough swallow for a lot of people but i think in this podcast i've laid out a pretty interesting roadmap. Now you get an inside look into Jack's head and kind of how I've been putting these pieces together for a really, really long time. And I have not, you know, just by talking about this, you can tell that I've been thinking about it a really long time and I've been researching it and studying it. I haven't talked about a lot of this stuff publicly because let's face it, 5G wasn't out for public consumption. But as I told the guys earlier, I had a member at my event last year who told me I was a pussy, that I needed to start telling people everything because he knew what I know. He's in this industry. So he's an industry insider. So that's the reason why I feel compelled. It's the reason I came to L.A. to personally tell you what I know, to do this podcast, to talk about this very issue. This is the night before I'm getting ready to say this in probably the first public setting. You're the first person that I'm talking to about this. Well, there's something really interesting that we were, we were alluding to earlier uh, before we were recording. We were talking about geoengineering, and I saw something in, in mainstream media recently that said Bill Gates and some other <laughs> really creepy globalists are – they didn't call them that. That's what I call them – are – wanting to dim the sun by spraying aerosols into the atmosphere. They're thinking about doing this in the future. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting because I remember it was about 1996. I started looking up in the sky in L.A. going, why are there tic-tac-toe 
cloud lines going all across the goddamn city that are totally out of normal flight patterns. A, because they're going nowhere in and out of LAX. They're coming from the valley headed to like South Central and back and forth. And, and then they don't go away. And I started asking people and they would say, oh, that's a contrail. You're a conspiracy theorist. And I thought, hmm, I was born in 1970. I used to lay in the grass as a kid and watch planes go by all the time. And I know what a fucking contrail looks like. It dissipates in about 30 seconds. What I'm seeing is not a contrail. I'm sorry. And if it was, how does a plane in mid... If it is a contrail, meaning condensation caused by, you know, the engine's exhaust essentially going through, you know, a human atmosphere and creating, you know, steam, then how do they turn the engine on and off in mid-flight? <laughs> Explain to me how a jet coasts in midair with no engines on because mm -hmm. they'll stop and start. So anyway, not a conspiracy. I don't know what it is. But it really pissed me off when the mainstream media goes, oh, hey, we're thinking about starting to spray the atmosphere and, and keep the earth cool by creating this reflective shield to reflect. That's the theory of geoengineering and chemtrails, right? And I thought, you bastards, just admit it, you know? And it's the same thing with 5G, how you're saying, oh, yeah, soon we're going to, Verizon announced we're rolling out 5G maybe by 2020 in LA. For two years, I've been driving up PCH and seeing the 5G um, transmitters on every other phone pole. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing... The and it's just... Like, that irritates me. I, I just can't help it. There's this part of me that's like, God, that's not right. You're going to be more irritated be when I tell you... When bullshitted I I, like that. I'll repeat what I said to you downstairs. Any place that has geoengineering, by definition, is going to be a 5G area. Why? What if I told you they had a geoengineer <clears throat> so that it, it, it minimizes the damage to living systems below? Because that's how conductive the plasma is. See, there's relativistic electrons that are being created from all this technology. And that's what the geoengineering is really all about. It's about protecting us from the collateral effects. This is the butterfly effect. So oh, Jesus. when I give you the paper tomorrow that I'm going to give you the handout, this, this is the reason I'm not talking about it. Because the science is very dense. But I'm going to give you my spiel, and I'm going to give you links. And when you see where the links go, they're going to take you to places like Stanford. They're going to take you to military papers about this. When you read it, you'll begin to understand. See, the conspiracy theory, this dopamine issue that I want you to understand, there's many of my friends out there that really believe that geoengineering <clears throat> is some kind of, you know, Agenda 21 kind of deal that we're trying to kill people. And it turns out really what the agenda is, we use geoengineering so that we can irradiate people so we can prop up the tech economy because what are we now? We move from a service uh, uh, country to a, a technology country. Our, our S&P 500 is totally about tech. The entire government is, is selling tech worldwide. And the thing is, we're all idiots. We're all, you, look at what we're doing. Look at us right now. I mean, think about it. And people are not connecting these dots. And I'm telling you, the reason they're not connecting them is it starts with the blue light. But then it gets, there's more levels to this onion. And I think if you go back and listen to this entire podcast and you start to see all these links and you're like, Jack is saying that each one of these things is linked, and the link is always tied back to control. Once you understand that, when, remember what I told you before. I said this on the stage. It's the mark of an educated mind to take something you fundamentally do not believe and examine it for yourself before you make a decision. I'm going to tell people listening to this podcast to do exactly the same thing. I'm going to do it to you first because tomorrow you're going to hear what I said. And I'm going to show you those papers. I'm probably not going to release those papers to anybody else, but I'm going to let you guys see them. Because why? My concern is you're in a 5G city. You need to know this, Luke. You need to really know what you're up against. And I think when you understand it fully, then I think... Your position on things may change. You may say, you know what? I may be able to do this L.A. thing for maybe another year or two, but I, I may seriously need to. That's already been happening. I mean, I 
worked in an industry that you could only do here for 17 years. I worked in Hollywood. I worked in the entertainment industry. You can't do that in Idaho in right. a fucking EMF free zone. Right. So what am I going to do? I don't know how to be a logger. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Now I don't do that anymore. I still do own one school, a uh, fashion school, but it's online, which gives me a little more freedom in terms of mobility. So I already have my sights at least Topanga Canyon, Ojai. My first step will be being tethered to the city, but getting out of this electro smog because mm -hmm. it dude it affects me i might feel it i mean when there's going to be a lot more people like you though even when it. i travel i could just tell how much better i sleep mm -hmm. just getting out of here i mean i just my sleep is immediately improved well that's, that's that's part of the reason why i told you i was resistant to even coming out here but the reason i came i told the guys i said i came for one reason four years ago i came here and told you it was a blue light story you were here and i told them today I said, I didn't lie to you then, and I'm fucking not going to lie to you tomorrow. I said, what I'm going to tell you tomorrow is going to blow your mind. If you thought I was good four years ago, wait. On a political level, because I want to be solution-oriented, okay? One solution is, you know, you get a building biologist, you fortify your home, and at least try to keep some of these fields out, make it safe inside, so at least while you're sleeping, your kid's sleeping, you can minimize the fields, you know, much easier to do in a lower-density population, obviously, in a rural area. But even within the city, there are some mitigation things that will at least help. But on a on a regulatory basis, I've seen a few things here and there where a few cities are, you know, there's so much public outcry, like Mill Valley in Northern California. Mm -hmm. They're saying, fuck you, no 5G here. And they have these city council meetings and shit, and they, they're they fighting Verizon and whoever, Qualcomm, whatever but, it is. But and they're they, like, but they don't realize the host of 5G is still going to be flying over them. I mean, it's the most ridiculous thing. So even if it's not in your local community. It's still there. And the reason why, that this is the reason why all these other issues we talked about, this, this third Van Ellen belt is a huge big deal. If the radiation can't get out, it's going to fundamentally change what happens on this planet. And that truly is an effect of geoengineering. And I do believe NASA wants, they want this project going on because I think they want to figure out how to build an atmosphere on Mars. I think that's really <laughs> the, the fucking end game. Whoa. I'm not kidding. I think that's what the federal government is really up to. If you ask me that they are using us to figure out how to make Mars habitable. That's exactly what the game plan is. To build an artificial atmosphere. That's what they're doing. Using the geoengineering. Absolutely. And, and there's the no radiation. there's absolutely no doubt about it. And and to understand the staggering and this truly is, I mean, from a science perspective for me, I'm very interested in this because when you think about it, you have a dead red planet because it doesn't have a magnetic field, doesn't have water except at the poles. The interesting thing is if you created an atmosphere, technically, that would be the biggest feat in human history to take a dead red desert and turn it into a habitable planet. I mean, let's face it, that would be epic. Now, do I also think it's epically stupid to do it when you really don't know what you're doing, when you really don't know how nature fundamentally works? I think that's a problem. And I think we're pushing the boundaries way too fast. And I think as we try to do this, I think we're harming our own place and harming it in ways that most of us don't even understand. I mean, I tried to bring in this podcast with you just a, a little tincture of something that I've never talked to anybody else about. And when you start to realize the effects of this, you start to go, whoa, because it's affecting all the diseases that we have, we call it, you know, diseases of aging or Neolithic diseases. I think these are diseases that have been created by this plan. And it started with light. It started with the AC power grid of Tesla. But now everything that we have plugs into this shit. And the, the, the 5G thing is really the connectivity. And if you think about it, when you connect everything together, it's just like in the Internet. The more nodes you connect together the more power you get from the network. Well, that means that they're looking to rapidly expand this ability for some reason. What do you think that reason is? Do you think it's just communication? I mean, are you happy already with your Netflix or do you really need it that much faster? Dude, I, I was happy with my flip phone from Nokia in 1998. <laughs> well, that's that what, was fine. That's what I'm saying. You know? I mean, people, I just don't think people um, 
realize it. And I think the funny thing is when people use their phone more and they get more blue light radiated, their dopamine levels go lower. They believe, oh, yeah, I do need to go out and get the new iPhone 10. I, I have to have that because it's a new phone. Uh, I, and I have to have my download speeds fast. Like, it'd be unheard of for my phone not to work, you know, super duper fast. Well, the scary thing about it, you know, and I love that we're just like unabashedly going for it uh, in the, the conspiratorial, not just the health implications, but is the data mining that is already happening, right? The tracking and then with That's why the data is so important to them. And with having that data is valuable, you know. I mean No, no, the data is the key to figuring yeah. out how to control things. Right. And but yeah, they but, still haven't made sense of it yet. That I can tell right, you. Right, right. But if you say you have a house that's completely 5G wired and everything's run on Wi-Fi, your lighting, your refrigerator as you said, you know, you run your microwave to make a phone call, all of that shit. That doesn't just arbitrary um, data that's gone that goes to waste your behavior patterns and things like that and the ability to spy on your conversations and the fact that my iPhone is listening to me right now even though they tell me it's not right and how Siri just turns on and shit and is like wait what did you say you're like I wasn't fucking talking to you Siri you know all of this and that is in terms of just humanity's inherent right for sovereignty and the basic human need for freedom that we all have. Well, but that's but that's what the, and, that's what the technology is all about. Yeah, Luke. it's that, about a Fourth Amendment problem, and I'm telling you right now, I think the two big things that are going to happen politically in our country, you're going to see the, the Supreme Court is going to be tied to this Fourth Amendment right with technology, but the other big thing, it's going to be a battle for water on this planet. Mark my words, because the higher this radi this radiation goes up the more dehydrated everything on this planet gets, that resource is going to become very scarce. And it's already oh, starting it, to happen. It dehydrates all living things. It becomes Mars. Right. Uh -huh. Think about what oh, wow. we're doing. Wow. Think about what we're creating a microwave planet. What happens when you microwave anything? It dehydrates. You've ate old steak that you've put in a microwave right if you don't put a paper towel around it it's been quite a while but yeah <laughs> but, but it tastes like shit <laughs> yeah right like shoe leather well yeah. what i'm trying to explain to people is this third van allen belt is a very similar story to that we unfortunately live on the tectonic plate so we are the steak and all the diseases that everybody knows about like the diabetes you talked about the obesity crisis the suicide crisis the opiate crisis these are all collateral butterfly effects from the effect of this plan that's really what's going on that's how i see it and the thing is i don't think there's a lot of people like most of the people that listen to this they may get it but i don't think most of the people in the world out of the seven billion that are there we'd be lucky if we get about five hundred thousand that really truly get it and when you ask me, who am I looking for? I'm looking for that 500,000. I'm looking for those people that are going to listen to this podcast and go, this guy's been thinking about this a lot. This guy is looking into stuff that other people aren't looking into. Because let me tell you something. If you think this is about Netflix speeds and connectivity and fucking selling people a new cell package, you're a fucking idiot. I can tell you that. There's a lot bigger thing at stake here. And the thing is, it's about time. Now that we're here, the, the flip is, the, the switch is flipped. It's time for us to have this kind of conversation and start talking about it. Hopefully when you get other guests on and you bring people on, you know, you share this kind of stuff. Say, look, you know, what, what are you doing about this? How does this affect this angle? Are you worried about this? Just like you said, there's going to be some people – that say, oh, no. And, you know, those are people, for me, I turn their pilot light off. I'm not interested in dealing with them anymore. <laughs> funny. But it's the truth. That's how I feel. Well stated. Yeah, I get that. I get that. You know, there's the other side of this, too. And that is, I don't know, I always have this fine line with having an awareness. You know, like I'm, a, I'm somewhat aware of what's going on politically, environmentally, uh, in terms of health, risks, the EMFs, all the stuff we're talking about. And there's the other side of it, where it's like, where does my biology actually start to get adversely affected, not only by the things that are going on, but about the paranoia 
and the negativity and the fear that I'm now living in. So you but that's know, all dopamine. So we have a conversation like this, and I'm like, oh fuck, now I can't touch my phone, and I, you know, I'm getting irradiated. And how do we deal with you know understanding the reality and not putting our head in the sand and ignoring it, but also stinking the I mean, biology of belief kind of the Bruce Lipton thing where. You know, how much can we mitigate just by keeping love in our heart and keeping a positive mental attitude? I think there's a limit. And not getting caught in the, you know, the fear, I think, is really bad for you physically I'm not, I'm not, uh, the funny thing is, as we're sitting here talking about, when you said all that, I'm not afraid at all. In fact, I tell all my members, I'm pretty optimistic about things. The reason why is I think we're going to have such an unmitigated, obvious public health disaster that it's going to become blatantly obvious what the problem is. And, and then what is going to happen, we're going to go through a period of actually figuring out how to use technology safely. But do I think there's going to be a lot of collateral damage? Yeah. In fact, the reason I believe this, because as a physician, one of the things I can tell you that I've learned is people don't fix things proactively. They wait till the shit hits the fan then they react. And not everybody does. Some people, you know, who get lung cancer, they continue to smoke. Okay. And I, I, there's no illusions for me. There's going to be some people out there that get an autoimmune condition or, you know, get a brain tumor on the side of their head and they're going to still fucking use their cell phone. They're, it's not going to change. And there's going to be parents out there that think that it's perfectly fine to buy an iPad for their kids as a babysitter. Those idiots will always exist. Okay. This isn't about them, Luke. That's, that's not why we're doing this podcast. We are not talking to those people. This is a natural selection. <laughs> it's evolution. That's right, exactly right. That's funny. And you know that I said it downstairs to the guys <laughs> and even their eyes got big. And I, and I, I told them, I said, look, as a physician, I didn't come into this with that idea because that is definitely anti-physician. But then I realized when I started putting all these pieces together, I'm like, this is exactly how evolution works. It's survival of the fittest. And if we keep catering to the fucking lowest common denominator, we're fucking idiots. We're, we're bigger idiots than you can imagine. So when I do turn the TV on and I do see some of the shit, oh, we need to have this, we need to do this, we need to do that. I'm like, hold on. Why do we need to do this? Explain to me why. Because there's you mean a narrative. In terms of like not hurting people's feelings and Correct. padding the entire world. Yeah, like world what political people? correctness is all about. Because yeah. that's what, that's the world the left is trying to create. They're trying to create a world where it makes it easier for us to be controlled because we're weaker correct and in other words we are for want of a better term i'm channeling four years ago daniel vitalis we're not wild anymore we're zoo fucking animals yeah and the key thing is i want people through this discussion to at least think about these things it's okay if you don't believe it i have zero problems with it but i don't want you to think the fear is the real issue for me, I'm not worried about it. See, I like hearing that because I, I'm fucking paranoid, dude. When I drive around and see chemtrails in the sky, I think it has a negative effect on me because well, it, does. it makes me paranoid. No, but it does. But you The have to- fear hurts me, though, as much as whatever shit I'm breathing in from the, but you the just, atmosphere. This is what you have, to, you have to realize. You're a smart enough guy now to know that the link is through your dopamine level. And, you know, a lot of people who, who make their job trying to misunderstand me on the internet – They use this dopamine thing. They try to use it against me saying, oh, that's just Jack's fancy way of saying we're a dumb fuck. That's not true. Dopamine is very interesting. You know the the statement, um, what's the difference between pleasure and pain? You've heard that cliche many times, right? I don't know. Well, it turns out it's the level of dopamine, light, UVA light, that creates dopamine. So the reason why that line is so thin in nature between pleasure and pain or murder and passion is because when it's too little or too much, it's a problem. Mm. What does the word quantized mean? It means highly specific and highly sensitive. What does that mean? The light frequencies that come from the sun is how that chemical is designed to work. So what happens when we introduce other parts of the spectrum that we're not supposed to have? We change the firing rate of how that chemical works. Oh. So that's the reason why. So it's sort of like changing the gauge of a needle, like how much medicine gets through. Correct. Interesting. And that's what I want you to understand because when you do have the fear response, that is the 
paraventricular nucleus in the brainstem where all stress begins, that's what you're getting. But the thing is, if you understand it, say, okay, I'm having, I, I feel bad about this. Like you can feel a panic attack coming on. You're going to be in a point where you're going to be okay for a period of time. When your redox drops further, that's when you're going to go batshit crazy. Now, the problem that I see, that problem already exists in this town. That this town, this state is very afflicted by that. That's what I see. <laughs> totally. I could see it too. But I'm serious. I, yeah. I look I yeah. I look at what's going on well, in dude, California. Dude, you look at I mean, if you go to downtown LA or you go to San Francisco and you look at the drug addiction and the and Unbelievable. the homelessness Unbelievable. and the mental illness. And and Nancy Pelosi says, Hey, it's okay. It's and fucking, I'm going, Are you fucking ki- it's kidding me? Crazy. I mean, I think we just get acclimated to it because you're kind of used to it. And you go, oh, yeah, a bunch of crazy people, needles, people pooing no. in the streets. Think about what you That's just said. Normal. You're acclimated to it because the non-native EMF has dulled you through the dopamine effect. And you don't know it because it's below your perception level. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That's why you're seeing kids. Look, it's so rare for kids to be depressed You know, in prior years. Why all of a sudden, in the last 20 years, do we have school shootings? Why do we have all this? Something has radically changed, and it's not fucking in us. It's in the environment. And that environmental change is changing us. And that's, that's where the fear comes from. The problem is, if you have enough wherewithal, if you're able to hack your environment enough to keep your sanity long enough, and here's what the end game is. If you can't, you're not going to be able to put this stuff together. You know, how you always get on my case, Jack, you know, this is mind-bending stuff. Maybe you're starting to see why now I'm such a big stickler about what I'm doing. Because to put this stuff together, you really have to really go deep. You, I'm What I told you today in this podcast literally probably drew on about nine or ten different branches of science. You heard me talk about climate science. You heard me talk about Lorenz's paper, Sven Mark's paper. These are things that you probably didn't even know about. Like, Jack, how the fuck did you know to go look there? Guess what? Everything is connected. One rabbit hole leads to the next. That's how nature works. There's no fabric, no no weave that she ever makes that's not connected. And the thing is, we live our life as linear thinkers. And it turns out nothing in nature is linear. Nothing. But we act as if it is. And the thing is, when you actually sit down and have a discussion like this, a cogent discussion... And think about these things, like the big problems of today, and you realize that we didn't have these problems prior to technology, you start to go, hmm, that's Well, there's a bell curve. I mean, you can't deny. I mean, I can visualize it now, the introduction of cellular technology. And even going back to, uh, we were talking about um, World War One, mm-hmm. World War II. Yeah. With, that's when radar with came. radar, right. right? That's when we we went. To, that's to when the people Japs. first started going off the fucking rails mentally. Mm-hmm. Well, I tell people this all the time. You know the the first time a paper on autism was ever written, nineteen forty. What's what about Alzheimer's? When did it show up in the literature? Nineteen oh one. When did the when did every single disease that you're worried about today, like all the ones that are in top ten? None of them were on the charts before 1879. What happened in 1879? Uh, Invented the light bulb. The light bulb. (laughs) That's electric wiring. Oh, and light at night. Light at night. So even incandescent bulbs have blue light. They're a problem. Right. Wow. But guess what? Where where did it start? It really got to be a mass public health issue with Tesla and his AC power grid in 1893. How did that happen? Westinghouse and him won the bid for the world's fair in chicago and they lit the whole fucking place up and then everybody who was rich i want that how it still works the same way in your old business oh you're wearing chanel i want that yeah it's the fucking same deal dude and guess what marketers prey on people who are low dopamine think about what i'm saying now how, how many times did you hear me say from the stage today about marketing and obedient idiots that's a dopamine standpoint Dopamine's tied to addiction. It's tied to obesity. It's tied. Because you need to fix every time. Exactly every time right. I go on Amazon and like, yeah, yeah, I want to get this thing and da, and I get it and oh, I'm satiated for a minute. 
That's how, right? it, wor- that's how it works. I mean, and consumerism the thing is, is essentially fueled by dopamine because that's the reward system nature gives us. In nature, I'm a caveman. I find some fucking berries and I get a little dopamine hit, mm-hmm. right? I find the female that I desire, I get a little dopamine hit. So it's a reward system, but because now we have all these artificial means, whether it be heroin or a video game or whatever, to spike that to an unnatural right. level that we are uh, prone to being addicted to everything. That's true. But what we're talking about, and I want to be clear so everybody else knows this, and I don't know if you know it, but I'm going to put it out there. All the, the dopamine problems we're talking about are low dopamine states. Let's talk about when the dopamine state is high or the pulse rate's high. What disease is that called? That's called schizophrenia. So there's a a stage in between there. And you probably remember the artist, Jackson Pollock. What was he famous for? Remember, he was a rip-roaring alcoholic drug addict, but he was able to paint in fractals. Well, guess what happens when dopamine, the firing rate, is not good enough or too fast? You're in between. That's where Jackson Pollock was. You know what the fractal part of nature is? When light slows down, you're able to actually see life in a, in a series of stills. So that's how he painted. So time for him was very fragmented. So that's the reason why he painted the way he did. And most people didn't realize until after he's dead when they analyzed his pictures that everything he ever painted was in a fractal. Well, it turns out nature works in a fractal manner. So what am I trying to tell you? The light that comes through your eye and your skin actually sets the tone for how dopamine works inside you. Like the analogy you used before about the syringe and the needle was a really good one. But I want you to know it's not only just the size and the amount, it's also the pulse rate. Well, guess what controls the pulse rate? The electromagnetic signals from the sun. That's what controls it. So when you put a new one in, there's a new biophysical lever. That's how you can go the who schizophrenia to the new kid's depression. Or, you know, Chester Benningfield's depression. That's a low dopamine state. This one's a high, but it's not high or low. It's also the fire rate. And what controls that is light frequencies. So to put it in a simple terms, um, as far as some basic lifestyle choices we can make, okay, we can become aware of EMFs and how to mitigate them to the best of our ability in our environment. We can become aware of blue light that's not a natural spectrum of light and mitigate that through eyewear devices, um, changing the lighting in our home. I use like amber incandescent bulbs in my home and we can do that. Um, In terms of proactive things that aren't protecting yourself but getting in alignment with nature, something that you talk about is the importance of sun exposure and particularly sunrise and sunset so give Mm -hmm. us a little bit you know for people that are like oh my god fuck my life this is horrible (laughs) it's all doom and gloom you know how can we even in the environments that we're in that are you know hard to combat um how can we just adopt some simple practices you know the cold cold exposure sun exposure things like that that you've been talking about for a long time but I someone's think, listening to this they're like what are these guys talking about i'm scared what do i do when i wake up tomorrow see the sunrise never miss another sunrise the rest of your life if there's one thing you can do the rest of your life it's free it doesn't cost anything you must see the sunrise if you see the sunrise that is going to help you set your firing rate on dopamine. It's going to help you actually build your melatonin to help you sleep. When you sleep, you recover. The two control programs that control sleep are autophagy and apoptosis. They're also the two that control mitochondria. Most people don't know. Everybody thinks melatonin is just a sleep hormone. It turns out melatonin's big thing is it controls mitochondrial DNA. Oh, wow. So guess what? If you get that right, you get just about everything else right. So it's key. Now, I don't talk a ton about seeing the sunset, but I'm going to tell you, if you are electrosensitive or you have a big dopamine issue or you have some kind of mitochondrial disease, does seeing the sunrise and sunset make a lot of sense? Absolutely. Like what we're doing right now, to be honest with you, if you had a dopamine problem, putting a red light on at night is probably not a good maneuver. For most of my people, I'm talking about my members, that is a good maneuver. But most of your members, I don't know if that's the case. I don't know their context, but based on some of the shit that I've seen on your page, 
you know, I'm like, you got to be shitting me, bro. <laughs> He's referring to the the Lifestylist Podcast Facebook group, guys, which is fun, I think, because I know you're, you know, you don't just dip into people's group, but you're a pretty regular contributor to the group, and uh, I think people really enjoy that. So if you guys want to join, just go into Facebook, the Lifestylist Podcast Facebook group. You know, that's that's the point that I would make. You know, I just think people need to realize uh, the other thing I think that's important. We talked about this tonight. I think we all need to get together live and have discussions like this. Yeah. I think I think it's really, really bad that we only seem to come together on social media. Like we never have a relationship with people outside of social media. You know, <laughs> that's because I'm, I'm the asshole. That's always like I'll hang out with someone and I'll be like hey can we just record this like always make a piece of media out of socializing you know because it's like well we're gonna be here might as well knock out four birds at one stone but yeah the human the human connection i I think i think what your buddy he's laying still on the ground listen to this he made a very great point before we started this that dude we should have had that conversation and then i was gonna say to him and i didn't i said no i think what happened down there was good that it was just us with the guys talking because I think they got a good flavor of kind of the people that are the dynamic that was going on. You know, I think people learned a little bit about each other in that, that interplay. That's the thing that I think we're missing a lot on social media. You know, people, you know, they always say they have an ambient awareness of me. They think I'm a total jackass, you know, because of the things that I do on social media the thing is, when you sit down with me in real life, you come away and you go, this guy really thinks about things. He's he's a little bit different kind of cat when you get him and you see him live. He's, he's Well, yeah, it's interesting because you, and I'm sure this is no shock to you, and you know, you, you got a thick skin, but you're pretty combative on social media. And, you know, you I mean, you come into my group and say shit. I'm like, fucking Jack, I'm trying to run a community here. And you're like, that's fucking bullshit, Luke. That thing, you know, whatever it is, PMF or some shit. And I'm like, dude. Now, I take it with a grain of salt because I'm, I think, mature enough to disagree. Like, there's things you believe that I go, eh, I don't know. Works for me. Might not work for you. That's mm-hmm. fine. I'm not caught up in, you know, the dogma of, like, having to be right. Um, and I'm always willing to change my mind when I find out new information, too. It's one thing I really prize is an open mind. But what's funny about you, I think, Jack, is that you have this kind of cantankerous personality. You take no shit. You have no problem calling someone out, fucking talking shit about them on stage. I mean, sometimes it, it could be a little uncouth, I have to say. But when you sit down with you, you seem like a very happy person. Sitting there having this conversation, you're smiling the mm-hmm. whole time. Your eyes are lit up. Like you have some sort of spiritual connection going on in your life, whatever that looks like, which is very clear to me. Otherwise, I wouldn't want to hang out with you just because you're smart. There's a lot of smart people that are dicks and they have no heart. Correct. I'm not interested in hanging out with smart people that have no soul, you know? Yeah. So I, th- it, I think it, it's, it's, it's interesting, it's, I think, the way you're perceived because you are so, uh, you know, argumentative I- in your online presence in many cases. But when you sit down, you're a very warm-hearted, friendly guy. Well, I t- told you the reason why. I am looking. I use social media as a battlefield. I am looking for some very, very specific things. And I, I have this personal belief that when you put people into chaos, you truly see how they think and react. See, it's... We it's, call that... We, back in the day, uh, when dating, when I was less mature, we'd call that a shit test. Exactly. You'd be on a date with a woman and you'd say some crazy shit that you didn't necessarily mean just to see how bent out of shape she would get. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, how tolerant she was of... Exactly. You know, your... Well, you know what? Color humor. It actually it, it actually helps you to understand how someone else thinks too, because when you put them in chaos, the first one, two, three things, how they react, that tells you a lot. And believe it or not, I'm telling you my secret sauce. That's the reason why I do what I do. And the thing is, it's really it works so great on social media, because people react immediately. It's like lighting a fuse. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm, I'm looking for the right people. I'm not looking for everybody. And the thing is, when you think about social media, Luke, how many people are on it? There's millions of people on it. I don't want millions of people. You know, I'm not like... Who has time for that anyway? Right. Uh, but who wants two or three million followers? I'm not into the, being a Kardashian or into being David Wolf and having likes, likes, likes. No, I'm interested in people who actually can think, who really want to change the world. And they're willing to do something about it to do it 
because that's the way we're going to solve some of the problems that we talked about tonight. Right. When you, get, when you wake up people that have some influence. Correct. And that have heart and logic. Correct. I want to do a little, uh, you know, it's getting late. We got to do this thing tomorrow. But there's some questions I've been dying to ask you. All right. I want to do a little bit of a lightning round. You don't have to go too deep into these. But I think we've given people some really good fundamental information here. We've definitely gone deeper into a more broad spectrum than we have before on some of these things. But there's sometimes I'll be doing something. And I think, I wonder if Jack will be down with this if there's any efficacy to this particular practice or something. First one being CBD and cannabis products. Do you yes. see any value in yes. using those? Yes. Not recreationally. I mean, I'm just, I'm talking just inflammation, anti-cancer. Yeah. Or I, like I, wrote, I wrote a webinar. I did a webinar on it. Okay. Again, these are things, there's many times I don't tackle a topic for the reason I told you before. Yeah. If it's clinically oriented, it's going to stay away out of the public purview because it, it becomes an issue with medical licensure. You know, I'm, I'm glad you told me that too because oftentimes, and I've never talked about this with anyone, but oftentimes I see on social people ask you questions and you're like, those are for my members. And i got to be honest, I'm always thinking, oh, you have to go pay Jack to get that fucking information. Like, That's not you usually just want more. You want more people like wrangled into your paid version of the site. I mean, honestly, just a marketing perspective. Yeah. I never thought about the liability of you publicly saying, yes, this yes. cures this and that cures that. And well, if you don't scary. believe me, you know what happened with Tim Noakes, right? No. Tim Noakes was a doctor from South Africa who posted one tweet about food. He was actually talking about breastfeeding to a baby. They tried to get take his license away. It took him, I think he spent... Two three million dollars. He he just it just ended literally about six months ago. So for people wow. who don't think this is real, yeah, you know, when, when I say that's for my members, what I'm telling you is you just stepped into a topic, and and, and I'm surprised that you feel this way because you know that I I kind of don't mind talking about anything, yeah, but. When it comes to that, you just stepped into a pile of shit. Well, I never see. I, I actually never thought about that, about about the liability and you it's know, a huge issue. I even the have AMA a, and yeah, licenses have, and all I, that kind of stuff. I have a, a form on my website that says "Ask Jack," and there's ground rules. It says if you get too clinically oriented, Jack's not going to go there. But right. I I tell my members that. But the thing is, when we're private, which our group. I have no boundaries. Right. That's one of the cool things about being a member. Dude, you can ask me anything, you know, to what the lottery numbers are going to be, to, you know, how deep is my love. I, I don't, <laughs> right, it doesn't right. bother me at all. Right, right. But I can't do it I totally on social get that. media. Yeah, and maybe totally it's good, maybe it's good that we, you asked me this in the lightning round so people yeah. understand. I'm not doing it because I don't want to answer your question. Yeah. I physically can't answer that question. If you really want an answer, join me. I, I mean, you can come on my Patreon site. Dude, it's five bucks a month. If I'm not worth a cup of coffee a month, then you've already told me what, how you really value me. Yeah, that's cool. Well, I'm glad we got to cover that because I, I have a feeling I might not be the only one. It's like, God, why, why do I got to join something? Just answer the question. But I'm also um, not beholden to anyone or anything except for big tech censorship. If I talk about shit that they don't want me to talk about, I could be disappeared like many voices are exactly. uh, currently. So that is a concern, but I don't give a fuck. I'm going to say what I want to say, whether it's chemtrails or vaccines or whatever. I just, I don't give a shit. Cut me off. I'll find a way to reach five people and I'll help someone. Mm -hmm. But I don't have to worry about any licensing or anything like that. So I can say whatever I want. Doctors so I, have to be very careful. Yeah, I respect media. that. Hey, and listen, man, um, you know, I'm also aware that many naturopathic doctors have just fucking disappeared off the face of the earth in the last couple of years. Like a lot of them, mm -hmm. you know, um, committed suicide by you know, impossible feats, um, you know, shooting themselves from across the room and all kinds of weird stuff. So I get it. But generally speaking, we could say CBD cannabis has value mm -hmm. in certain cases. What about microdosing uh, psilocybin, LSD? There's already great studies on this. In fact, uh, you probably don't know this again. This is another topic that I did with my members in a webinar. I had Erwin LaCour. You know, he's the oh, guy. Oh, yeah, big movement. Guy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, MoveNet. And he came on, and I did one of his, his uh, events. This was like five, six years ago. And this was the big topic. And he's the one that got me to say, Jack, I think you really need to talk about this. 
I said, well, why don't you come on and I'll do a webinar, me and you going back and forth. Then I'll do all the science because he's not a big science guy. So I actually went into the science and talked about clinical trials that were going on at NYU with ketamine, with also the mushrooms and even LSD. And people were stunned. I said, look, it's in the literature. It's not like I don't know about it. I just don't talk about it. And the reason right. why I don't talk about it is for the reasons mentioned. It's clinically oriented. If I start talking about things like that and it, it becomes associated with me, people are going to say, oh, well, Jack has become the new Thomas McKenna you know, or Terrence yeah. McKenna. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and, you know, then the next thing you know, you'll have the board showing up to your house. That's not how this rolls. Yeah. So if it's clinically oriented, hopefully maybe from this podcast when you release it from now on, and it's not just Jack, it's all doctors. You need to be very, very cognizant. And you know, Luke, when people ask you on Twitter, oh, like my grandmother has, you know, a hanging hemorrhoid. What do we do for that? Believe it or not, something that innocuous, you can lose your license over. Right. So you need to be aware when we say the things we do, we're saying it for that reason. That's really the reason. Yeah. And, and I think there's some, some value in that. I mean, some regulatory agencies are there for a reason and- you don't want someone who you trust. Oh, you're a doctor. Cool. I'm going to do whatever you say. You well, know. it's a, the, there's a flip side to this story, though. The flip, I mean, si the flip, it, the flip side, it? the flip side to the story to me is even a bigger topic, maybe for another podcast. But to me, it's unbelievable that we have people calling them functional medicine doctors who are fucking acupuncturists who don't know shit from Shinola, <laughs> who are out there telling uh. people to do this and to do that. And they have no regulatory boundaries. Really? They can say whatever the fuck they want. Oh, interesting. So if you're, guess a, what? If you're a functional medicine doctor or a naturopath, you have more leeway? I'm, I'm just going to tell you. I think that everybody who hires these people, and I'm going to be very, I guess, to the point on this, because this is a real problem. They get on our case as allopathic doctors for treating through the prescription pad. They're doing the exact same fucking thing with supplements. And, and lab tests. They're making a fortune of ordering people's labs, $3,000 a month, and then ordering $1,000 worth of supplements. And, and they have – it's as bad as writing a script, a script for statins. Interesting. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. I think they're as big a problem as the guys pushing the statins and everything else. So to me – this is this is an interesting thing, and they get away with it more because they have nobody breathing down their neck. Interesting point. I was unaware of that. Okay, so we got affirmatives on the first one, which is great, because I sometimes, I, you know, I run out, you know, you lose the deal or whatever, but I like to microdose psilocybin. But when I say micro, I'm not talking about getting high. I'm talking it's almost imperceivable that you're even you even did anything but with a little lion's mane extract very productive good mood i'm into it i've not done the lsd or any of that other crazy stuff though i mean i used to do you know real lsd <laughs> um, macro dose <laughs> um and and you're you're into the dha but not so much in supplement form. You don't like never fish in oil supplement. and algae oil and all no. that stuff i wrote a blog post just seven years whole fish fish Okay, and then the next question I always get from people, because I, I like fish, my body responds well to fish, is all of the PCBs and the mercury and the metals and all the shit that's in our oceans getting All functional fish. medicine BS. So it's, you, they, These are narratives that are out there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, if you go and post my name and put like seafood, radiation, seafood and plastics, seafood and anything else, yeah. you will see... Epic conversations. Okay, cool. So we can dive deeper <clears throat> into that. Just Google you yeah. and that topic. Um, and would you say generally it would be advised when you're eating seafood to eat smaller fish lower on the food chain? Yeah, because... That have been living less that's time? Th that's how the marine chain works. So the bigger fish like swordfish and tuna, if they're going to have a problem, it's going to be in the bigger fish. Yeah. Smaller fish like sardines, it's, it's not really an issue. The bottom line is when you understand what I'm getting ready to tell you tomorrow and what, what the melanopsin story is about. <clears throat> Fundamentally, melanopsin dysfunction destroys DHA in your body. Not only does it destroy the photoreceptors, but globally knocks it down. Well, what is DHA important to? It's the electromagnetic antenna that allows the outside to talk to the inside. 
So guess what? Wow. If the outside environment correct to your biology, okay. So when somebody tells you, uh, you know, eat algal DHA or eat a pill, you hopefully can understand now why my eyes get that big, because that is a person that's announced themselves to you that they're a fucking moron, and <clears throat> they're hurting you. They're really hurting you. And I just got finished telling you the world that we're building is a 5G world. That stimulus has now gone up exponentially. So now you need to triple down on seafood if you live in L.A. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the point. That's good to hear. I need to eat more more seafood. Well, I kind of just forget because it's not my favorite. I mean, I tolerate it, but it's not like my favorite food. It may become your favorite if you start noticing that the more you eat of that, the less supplements you have to take. Right. You may start going, and or when you fly in L.A., you start feeling better. Right. Okay, noted. Actually, you know, it's funny. I thought of you because when I was flying back from uh, Florida the other day, they had uh, sea bass. Ah, it's my favorite fish. And I ate it, but I, I don't know if it was the sea bass or the – it was probably the fucking raviolis, actually. Oh. But I got horrible gas. And I was like, ah, oh, the fish must have been bad, I think. It was probably the raviolis because yeah. of the gluten or glyphosate in the gluten or in the, <laughs> in the wheat, whatever it was. Uh, and then you said you're not a fan of the molecular hydrogen tabs that you drop in water because – the powder magnesium shit they're made of has deuterium. No, uh, I'm, what I'm saying is until I hear from the manufacturers exactly what their process is, mm -hmm. then I'm not going to sign off on it, any of that. Do I think the idea that you have is a good one? I do. But the problem is we have no control in how they're selling it. So you don't really know what you're getting. And when you don't know what you're getting, that means there's sometimes you could have good reactions and sometimes you have bad reactions. And it becomes a big issue when you have, say, low redox versus high redox. So that's what my problem is. My problem is when you have a, a dynamic or a variable that you can't control for and no one's giving you the answer, the answer is use the precaution principle. Abstain. What about the molecular hydrogen gas that you inhale? No pills involved. Yeah, but you put the same, water the, in the machine, but and you're making a. a it's a, the same thing. The molecular water, hydrogen gas it, depends what kind of water you use. You put distilled water. Oh no, I would put deuterium depleted water, and do it that way. Uh, you see what I'm saying? See, you have. You're to, not getting any of the any of the deuterium oh, from the gas, are you? Oh yes, you are, my friend. Really? Oh yes, and and that that's the point that I'm trying to make to you, is that you will be shocked at how much you can actually find, and the thing is. When, when you understand how hydrogen is handled in foodstuffs and how delicate nature goes to these lengths, and when you use a supplement that's made in a lab or made in some corporation and you have no earthly idea what their control was for hydrogen, I don't think that's a smart move. I mean, especially when you already know that you you're live in a variable environment. Dude, I think you're playing with fire. I really, really do. And do I think that could be the cause of, say, psychotic breaks or a, a heart attack immediately or an arrhythmia? Yeah. I think that's a very real risk. Noted. What about ayahuasca? I'm okay with it. Infrared saunas. Uh, I'm okay with those too. But, again, I'm always going to, like I say, um, if there's an uh, – an A available, don't settle for a B, C, or D. So for like you, when you're traveling and stuff, I'm fine with that. But if you tell me that that infrared sauna is the way you get red light all the time and you never go in the sun, I'm going to tell you no way. Yeah, I'm big on the sun, but not sunrise. See, the, that's where I'm fucking up. And it's been talked about so much, and Maddie's always telling me, he's like, dude, you got to go. I'm like, how am I going to get up at 6.30 a.m., man? Like, I go to bed at midnight. I need my sleep. But the, I, I now I'm seeing the reason my circadian rhythm is fucked up and why I have so much energy at night. After 10 p.m., I'm on fire. In the morning, I don't get energy until like 11 a.m. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because you never see the sunrise. Yeah. All right. So got that. Um, um, why don't you like PEMF devices? Because the, what, what does the P stand for? Pulsed. What does it make? RF. You're, you're increasing the third Van Allen belt. Okay. You're supposed to say duly noted. <laughs> what about 
the device that I have downstairs. I don't know if you know of this amp thing. Coil. That, no, not no that amp coil, the Nano V that yeah. makes exclusion zone water. Yeah, I mean, I, I again, I'd have to hack it and see. Okay, just got to see what it uh, emits, what it's actually doing. And remember, anything that is an electromagnetic device that's with water, you have to be very careful with. Why? Because water is imprinted by electromagnetism. One of the guys downstairs just asked me a question about some kind of contraption he has in the house for water. And it had a blue light in it. And I was like, dude, no blue light anywhere near your water. I said, if you want red light near your water or you want to put you know, a UVA light by your water, I'm cool with it. Because it does change the topology of the hydrogen bonding network. Just light alone wow. does that. And people don't realize this. So when uh, Matt Blackburn was talking about how he structures his water and puts it in the Myron glass in the sun, mm -hmm. what do you think about that? Is I'm, that gonna, I'm actually okay with that. That's pretty cool, right? No, it is. And, and mirroring glass actually mirror glass. has a really good effect on, on different things. But the point that I made there, and I hope you understand it, an event like this, he has a duty when he's a speaker, when he says something, if you don't know how it works, tell him you don't know how it works. Because they need... To <laughs> That's what I always do. Someone's like, w w what about the science? I go, I don't know. I just like the way it feels. Talk to the experts. Well, I'm but, giving anecdotal evidence here. Of but like, that's not how it I was sold downstairs. And that's what I'm trying to explain okay. to you. When somebody says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you verbatim what I heard. I don't know what you heard. I've been studying water for seven years, and this is what I found. Well, if that's not a declarative, definitive statement, so why did I say what I said when I was on the stage and you saw... The asshole factor came out in me. I was like, okay, well, fucking tell them how it works. And when you can't, see, this is what I call pseudoscience. pseudoscience when you can't describe how something works, it's pseudoscience. To you, it is. Well, I'm going to tell you what. When you can, then it's not. When someone can explain it to you, they go, okay, great. But people should not be getting on stage or talking to other people on a social media platform when they really don't know what's going on they should say hey this works for me i'm not sure about the science maybe you should go ask somebody about this that and that that very rarely is said by people hmm. and to me that's a problem because you know how social media works oh well luke said this therefore everybody's going to do it well what happens if luke's wrong what happens if luke didn't read all the stuff you know and it turns out you know there's cyanide in this shit Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And the thing is, people don't think about this. And I think these mistakes are big on social media because I see it on my forum all the time. I'm a stickler on my own forum. Like if Luke did something, a biohack, and it worked, then Lucy wants to do it. I go nuts on my own people if they do that. It's like Luke's mitochondria, not your mitochondria. His environmental situation is not yours. What makes you think that you and him can have the same effect? And people don't realize that. And I think part of that is not only from being a doctor, but also being a black swan mitochondria. I realized even more so from that angle that it really is an N equals one game. And when you understand that it really is an N equals one game, you have to be really careful about what you're going to do. And that may give you some more insight why I'm such a stickler about the supplement thing. Because guess what? Supplements that work on Luke may have a devastating effect on, on Brian or Matt. And the thing is, people don't realize it. I've experienced that. And that's especially with ones that are synthetic, you know, like uh, something like modafinil. Mm -hmm. I always tell people, like, enter at your own fucking risk here. Like, for me, if I'm flying or I'm just totally smoked, I do like a quarter of that thing. And mm -hmm. I feel awake and I feel pretty good. But I've given them to people, I warn them, and then they take a half or a whole one, and they're like, oh, I felt great, but the next day I was super depressed. I go, well, it doesn't work with your brain. Like, uh -huh. don't fucking do it then. Uh -huh. Everyone's unique, and also everyone's biology is constantly changing. So shit that I did last year that I loved and I felt really great on supplement-wise, now I don't like it anymore. It's like uh -huh. my body's like, eh. So anyway, uh, noted on that. Okay, a couple last ones here. We already covered a few of these. Oh, I know. There's one. Okay, say you make your bedroom or your bed into a Faraday cage because you want to block out all of the negative frequencies that are coming in. 
is there a risk of actually blocking the positive frequencies mm-hmm. as well that yep. you do want from the atmosphere you know coming any, on you? You know anything about Rutger Weaver and the studies that he did on the students? The people that lived underground? Yeah, the college students. That shit. They went, they went batshit crazy very quickly. Yeah. So, so you, there is a big risk. So, so if you sleep in a Faraday cage, that could you, happen to you. Yes. God damn. You can't fucking win. Well, that's part of the reason why when we talked to the guy downstairs about yeah. the, the isolation tanks, you saw I was very much a fan of that. Yeah. You, you need to realize this is, this is a key point that you brought up. If you're going to live, say you're electrosensitive and you know that you have to I live. I pretty in, much am. But, I mean, you, you have to live in a Faraday cage. Yeah. That means that you absolutely have to connect with nature. So one of the things that Matt right. said from the stage, he said, hey, sometimes you're going to have to go take a four or five or six day trip. You may have to do that more. You may have to be a camper. You may have to get an RV. You may have to do that. That's that's the part of the story, Luke. It's the other side that people don't talk about. You know, it, it's frustrating to me because people want to talk to you about, oh, yeah, I have this Faraday cage and this and that. And they never ask this question. And you heard right away what I say, Rutger Weaver. And you're like, oh, shit, there's literature on it. And you yeah. even remember reading it. Yeah. And people need to understand this. Well, again, because it goes back to nature. In nature, say we go back to 1700 and I live out in the tundra somewhere in the forest, I'm still connected to the atmosphere and to the stars. Like I would never, you're never in a Faraday cage in nature, right? It doesn't exist. Water. Oh, and if you're in a body of water. Body of water is technically a Faraday cage. And the reason why, because water has a huge heat capacity. What does that mean? It has an amazing ability to absorb light. That's the reason why life uses water as its main transformer. You can bury tremendous amounts of light, especially red light. Red light's the one that you can put the most in. That's the reason why. I'll give you a perfect example because, uh, you know, I love teaching science. The, the shortest day of the year is December 22nd. What's the coldest day of the year? Uh, January 21st. 19th. <laughs> January 19th. So I want you to think about this. Okay. What does December 22nd mean? And uh, the reason I want to bring this up is because it's getting ready to happen. Yeah. So the winter solstice is when the sun is closest to the earth. So we only get, it's the shortest day of the year. So we don't get as much sun. So you would think if you're a linear thinker that if that's the shortest day of the year, it should be the coldest because the sun's rays do it. Right. It turns out that it's actually three weeks later. And the reason why has to do with the effect of water and water temperature because of how water works with light. Whoa. Because there's so much water on the planet. Correct. And when you understand this, this is also the reason why it goes back to my, my topic with you before about CO2, why I don't believe that. That's the reason why. And the, the vice versa is on June 21st, that's the longest day of the year. We should have, the water should be the hottest. Guess when it's the hottest? Hmm. A month later? A month later. later. Really? No shit, that's dude. That's crazy. Because that's because of the nonlinear effects in water. And when you think about it, say, wait, water in the ocean and we have water in us. So are these effects the same way? The answer is yes, it is. So when you start to think like a black swan, that's when you start going, you start asking better questions. So I need to sleep on a waterbed, basically. No, waterbed. <laughs> I wouldn't sleep on a waterbed. <laughs> okay. I, I really wouldn't. Submerged in water. Sleep in a float tank. I know. I have slept in a, a tub many times with water on me. Really? Yeah. Put ice on me, melt, and then you wake up and you're in warm water. Wow. What do you think of a uh, magnetico uh, magnet pad that goes under your no mattress? No problem. You like that? Been I using have, I've had one on my bed forever. 15 years. 10 goss, I think mine is. 20. We're cool with that? You need to go way higher. Really? So you're cool with that. I was so paranoid because I spent like five grand on that shit. <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, man. Because I trust your, I mean, you know, you're an expert. All, all I'm my, not. You, I'll, you I'll know why you. I bought it? I, I laid on it. They did a live blood cell analysis. Uh-huh. And my blood was all coagulated, fucked up, red blood cells all freaked out. Laid on that thing. It's totally passive, magnetic. It's not mm. plugged in anything. Laid on that thing for 15 minutes. They looked at my blood. Perfectly moving, beautiful blood. And I was like, I'm in. Here's my credit card. And uh-huh. that's all I needed to know. Well, the funny thing is, just so you know, I got to tell you this story since you asked me about it. I know we're doing rapid fire, but there's yeah. nothing rapid with me. That's okay. Um, one of my members did a educational consult with me seven years ago. And I happened to mention this as a hack to her. And she goes, wait a minute. She goes, why aren't you talking about this to everybody? I said, well, it costs like 5000 bucks, and I'm not going to 
talk about something publicly that costs five thousand dollars you know because a lot of people can't afford that and she goes no no you need to do this and then you know you need to do this that and the other thing so believe it or not if you would have told me you were going to buy it they had there's a member discount cruise 15 oh really and I got it for my members. This is before I knew you. Yeah. Well, I got it for my members I I because like of her. Ten years ago or something, I want to say. It was because of this girl. Wow. And I, I asked them to do that for my members. I didn't think people would buy it, but almost all my members have a Magnetico. Oh, cool. So Cool. Yeah, I've always wanted to interview uh, Dean Bromley. Yeah, I yeah. did, a, I did a, a TV program with him. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah, interesting guy. Yeah, he... Um, He's got this other thing in uh, Tucson, MME, mm -hmm. this big magnetic fucking crazy thing. He cures people of MS and Parkinson's and all sorts of shit, putting them in there. Mm -hmm. Similar looking to an MRI. Kind of, mm -hmm. I don't really get the way it works, but fascinating, dude. Well, cool. Whew. Boy, that's a relief. <laughs> um, Use that more than the amp coil. <laughs> okay, cool, cool, good, got it, got it. Well, this one's easy because you just literally lay on your bed and go to sleep. The thing is, you know, if you have a thick mattress, you're not that close well, uh, to the field. It's, it's four inches is what Dean talks about. Yeah. I've actually hacked that. You actually can go, and, and believe it or not, the type of mattress you use makes a difference. So some of these new mattresses out, like the Lisa mattress, you know, that has – no coils in it. Yeah. You can't use, you got to be careful with I your I don't metal. have coils in mine. Well, you'd be surprised how many people do. And they use that pad and I'm like, you're nuts. Yeah. No, I have a Casper. Uh, uh, no coils. Okay. Uh, next is, I've never heard you talk about moving your body, any form of exercise. Do you talk about it? Do you do it? Yeah. I do. I mean, I, I, I think you don't, you don't have to do very much. I think running sprints, doing kettlebells, doing natural movement. I'm a big fan of Irma LaCour. Oh, okay. Huge. The move that stuff. Yeah, yeah, the move that guy, to me, he's the guy that gets it right. I like Ido Portal. Yeah. Uh, one of my best friends, wh who most people know, is Jeremy Tomley. He's a guy I told you that had cystic fibrosis. He's a rock climber. Mm -hmm. He does bouldering. Anything you can do that connects you to nature I'm a big fan of. You're not into being in a gym under blue light with a bunch of non-native. <laughs> to me, that's not exercise. That's psychotic. Yeah, yeah. And that's exactly, unfortunately, what most people call exercise. And they look at me. I'm, I mean, this is one of the cool things. Let's give California plus five. Venice Beach did it right. Right. The guys were all juiced up, but they were doing it outside. Right. Yeah. That's that. I think that's why I've never really taken to a regular exercise regimen is you have to go into gym to get the equipment. I always show that picture. Have you ever seen the picture from Western A. Price's book of the three black guys? One guy's 55, the next guy's 75, the other guy's 85. They're all ripped. They look like middle linebackers. Right. And, I, and when I put it up in my talks, I say, okay, what gold's gym did they go to? Right. And when you make the point to people who are like meatheads in the paleo community, you don't need a CrossFit box. You yeah. think you do, but you really don't. And the thing is, the exercise is important. It's more important, I think, as you get older, too, because it actually helps lower heteroplasmy. But I think the way in which we do it, and I think it's going to be a bigger issue in a 5G world, really big problem. So if you really get exercise wrong, exercise can hurt you. And you and I both have a friend, Ben Greenfield. I like Ben, like him a lot. I'm very concerned about what he's doing to his body. You know, and he, he and I have talked about it many times. I, I think a lot of the things that he advocates for his people, I don't get involved in his, you know, business and his sauce. But I, I, I think he, it may be good for Ben. I don't think it's good for a lot of other people. Being that hardcore, like pushing that hard I, and stuff. I don't even think it's good for Ben. I mean, look, I, I said downstairs a little while ago, we talked about Char Charles Poliquin. Guy looked like a brick shit house. You know, I talked to him many times about this issue. Yeah. He's dead now. So balance in terms of your movement. I hate the word balance because nothing about nature is balanced. True. That's the truth. I'm, what I'm, word do we use for your physical fitness regime then? Moderation? No, that's Common even sense. worse than balance. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, I'll give you one that'll shock you. It just hit me as soon as you said it. Quantized quantized to your environment in other words if you happen to live in a 5g environment i think you need to be very very careful with how you apply exercise i think if you're wilded in an equatorial area you, all you need to do is connect with nature i think most of us unfortunately live between those two boundaries and i think you have to figure out what that boundary is for you so for example a guy like me who's a neurosurgeon is in the hospital 
doing the social media thing, this and that. I'm pretty careful what I do. I'll run sprints. I swim a shit ton. I'm always in water. Um, and I do think swimming, if you ask me, swimming is like one of the best things. Yeah, I but love I'm going to default to what Maddie said on the stage. Do it in the fucking ocean. Yeah. You know, that's huge. I don't think a lot of people do that. The other thing, I, I tell diabetic patients, one of the things, I, and when they're in bad shape, I just want you to walk with your shoes off at the beach. You know, most of the other doctors tell the diabetics, no, keep your shoes on. You're going to get a cut and your foot's going to get cut off. They're never going to solve their diabetes if we don't start telling them to do things. So grounding in the right place, walking, it really, when I say quantized, it's quantized for your mitochondrial colony. And see, when I get a hold of you, either as a member or say as a patient at the farm, I'm going to quantify your colony of mitochondria then I can give you a pretty damn good answer to the question you just asked me. Right, right. Cool. That makes perfect sense. And speaking of walking barefoot, I've not been able to get uh, consistent answers on the different, you know, using like a little rubber grounding pad and Mm -hmm. things like this. I talk to really smart people all the time, and I get very different answers. Some will tell you, say we're in an electrical field like we are because there's lamps and wirings and shit like that. So I go, oh, I'm just going to always keep my foot on a grounding pad that's either plugged into the ground outside the building or the grounding wire in the building. And the theory there is that uh, you'll be getting the, um, the, the electrical ground coming from the earth, pushing electric fields away from your body. Those are the proponents of grounding and the guy selling the grounding shit. And other people say, no, you're making yourself an attractor field, a grounding rod, so that those electrical fields are now seeking you out and using you as a conduit. And you're now the ground which would not I'm, be I'm, good for you the answer is actually pretty simple okay and when i give it to you <clears throat> that's that'll give you pause if you use a grounding pad plugged into any plug at all that means that you're saying i implicitly trust the wiring diagram of this building i'm not willing to do that in any building mm. in other words i'm willing to do it in my building that, that i built Right. But if you want to ground, what I would tell you to do, even if you're on the 40th floor, get a long copper wire hanging out the window and let it go into the ground. Right. That's it. Right. I mean, I, I think there's easier ways to do it. But as you know, we had a pretty interesting discussion downstairs about grounding. Mm-hmm. And I told you, grounding, my opinion on grounding has radically changed in the last two or three years. And I told you the reasons why. I, there's a well-founded reason. We've made the assumption that grounding is the same effect that it was, you know, 200,000 years ago. And it turns out that that's no longer true. See, as the environment varies, that means what we do has to vary. And what we're doing to the environment right now in a 5G uh, standpoint is so radical that some of the things that we used to do, like I'll give you a perfect example. I'm going to talk a little bit about this tomorrow, but not a lot. That's why maybe we'll talk about it here. Um if you would ask me three, four, or five years ago, I was a fan of coffee. I'm no longer a fan of coffee. And the reason I'm not a fan of coffee is because if you break these photoreceptors in your cytochrome proteins down, what does caffeine do? It speeds electrons up. Well, if you've got broken engines, that means you're trying to put a huge current through a broken wire. You ever try to do that in an electrical line? That's how you fucking fry this circuit. Do you want to do that to your mitochondria? So guess what, dude? It's a big deal. And the thing is, this is the reason why so many people who live in that 5G area have that kind of problem. And it's, it's going to become a bigger problem. See, I think there's so many installed users of coffee. What's Jack's prediction? In the 5G city, you're going to start seeing people have a huge problem with coffee. Just like we saw 20, 30 years ago with gluten. Nobody had a problem with gluten except people who had real celiac disease. Now we see this non-celiac gluten hypersensitivity. You want to know what that is? That's melanopsin dysfunction in their gut that's causing it. That's the cause. So it's the same, the same story that I'm trying to illuminate for you with the, the non-celiac gluten sensitivity, I think is going to happen with coffee. Interesting. Okay, so with the grounding, it it really just depends on the environment and whether or not... The- I'd be concerned about you. Like, if you ask me the question for you, yeah. you now know the reason why I'm concerned. And that's yeah. good enough for me because I know that when you do other podcasts and you talk to other guys, 
you're going to put that qualifier in and say, look, it's not like Jack's saying that grounding's bad. Jack's just worried about where you're doing the grounding. Yeah. Because of the environmental effects. Yeah, well, if the concrete, say I'm, you know, I'm walking around grounded and the concrete has an electric field because there's all sorts of shit inside the concrete, mm-hmm. wiring and EMF and all this stuff. So you, you have to know, you have to know the fidelity of the building that you're in. I think when you're in a hotel, mm-hmm. you have no business grounding in any hotel. Right. I think that is completely psychotic. That's good because I do that. I have a little rubber pad. I, I would tell you, I would change that. Yeah. I would rather see you, if you were going to do anything, and this this may be a cool hack for you too. You know when you swim, you ground in the water because the mm-hmm. pools are grounded. Mm-hmm. So I would tell you, go take a swim. I'd right. be way better off for you doing that. Yeah. Okay. Noted. Cool. Yeah. And at, at home, I have a, a copper wire that goes out of the window. That's what we have too. Down into the wet ground and that's the best way to do it honestly it really is yeah okay cool awesome uh lastly if you can you know this might be difficult to answer in a in a short um in a concise way and i know we've been going for a really long time but i just can't how long how long have we been going Uh, two hours and 29 minutes fuck dude we're not gonna beat matt's (laughs) record (laughs) damn if it honestly if it wasn't midnight right now i would beat it but you mentioned something i think it was in the facebook group or something that i missed a big part of the deuterium picture and i'm going dude i did five and a half hours with some pretty bright people about you know what deuterium is why it's bad how to mitigate it and you said oh you missed a bunch of the deuterium stuff or whatever it was some comment about that can you kind of summarize what might have been missing from that conversation i could but i'm gonna tell you i don't think i will Okay, <laughs> and, I'll, and I'm I'm gonna tell I'm gonna tell you why. Okay, I will I will give you. Um, I think what Dr. Boros said in that podcast I think was pretty accurate. I think what the other two people said in that podcast was not so accurate. I think there was a lot of marketing glitz there. The other thing I will say, Dr. Boros is an expert in the biochemistry side of understanding how deuterium works through the Krebs cycle, the uh, TCA cycle, glycolysis, and even in protein deamination and things like that. But the biophysics, not so much. And the biophysics is what they all missed. And you know how I cut my teeth. I know the biochemistry, but I also know the biophysics. And I'll give you, I will give you one thing. Because I did say this in Vermont 2018 lecture, and the only way you're going to be able to ever hear it is you're going to have to go to Patreon. Why? Because it's got tons of clinical stuff. So you have to go to Patreon and buy that one. But Matt was there. If I told you what the real point of having deuterium in your blood and not having it in your mitochondria are, you would be shocked. And the cause is that we actually make UVC, UVB, and UVA light from the effect of deuterium with sunlight. And this is light that everybody around says is bad. You know, UVC light is looked at as, hey, that's toxic stuff. Well, it turns out, if you'll see a slide tomorrow that I'm going to show that I tripped all my members up on, there's four aromatic amino acids. All those aromatic amino acids have absorption frequencies between 200 and 400 nanometers. Do you know what the cutoff range for UVA, UVB, and UVC is? Turns out in Pollock's book. I love when you ask questions when you know I don't have the answer to it. But <laughs> turns out, turns out why? Remember what you said downstairs. I'm, 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 I'm doing this really for your benefit. Okay. You said nature would never do something without a reason. So Tell me why tryptophan, which is one of the aromatic amino acids that makes up serotonin and melatonin, and NAD, which is cytochrome oh, 1. Oh, interesting. Tell me, tell me why it has an absorption spectrum between 200 and 400 nanometer light if that light doesn't come from the sun. I got no goddamn idea. That's the part you missed, and it's the biophysics behind it. And trust me. It's a very important part of the story. In fact, it's the most important part of the story. And that's what you need to know. 
So if you don't know that, then you don't have the whole thing laid out. The whole picture of deuterium. Correct. And it turns out there's so many people marauding on social media that think that deuterium depletion and drinking the deuterium depleted water is the be all end all. I'm going to tell you that's not true. Matt will tell you. He's heard me say on my own member webinars that I don't think everybody needs deuterium depleted water. I mean, it shocked people. And I said, well, if you understand truly how it works, most people don't need it. The people that need it the most are the ones that have high heteroplasma rates. There's nobody in this room right now that has a high heteroplasma rate. So, so any one of us in this room could have taken, had our deuterium levels tested, and they could be higher than is recommended. That's the other part that I really don't want to talk about. But I, I'm going to tell you that <clears throat> let's just say we had some peer, I don't want to say peer, quality control issues that we did we don't have any faith in the accuracy of those tests. Who's Zero. We? People, people in the industry that correct. are smart people. Who who actually are looking into this. That test that they're ordering out of the, the place in L.A., I think it's not even worth the salt on your eggs. Really? Uh-uh. Interesting. Uh-uh. And the they're, they're, thing is, it's become a, a big clinical result for them. I think if people are really interested in, in deuterium, the best clinical outcomes that they could read is in Somalia's book. Somalia, Gabor Somalia's book called Defeating Cancer. You read that book, you, you will know clinically what you need to know about deuterium, and that's it. When you get to my realm, when people really start doing quantum biologic things within the clinic, that's when really gets interesting. And the, knowing the biophysics behind it becomes imperative. We're talking about bond angles. We're talking about really, really, really unusual stuff. Deuterium can be good and bad. And there are certain times that you need it, and there are certain times you don't. The one thing I will tell you, having a, between 147 and 153 parts per million in your blood is absolutely a beneficial thing. How's that? Interesting. Science always is. So what if we, uh, through diet, lifestyle, depleted water, get it down to 90? Is less better? Well, or does it, it depend on it the rest of no, what's it's going gonna, on with you? It's going to depend on where it is. See, right now, you're being sold a narrative that the test is an accurate reflection of what? And no one's asking that question. You didn't ask that question on the podcast, which you should have. Say, so what are we measuring? Are we measuring Krebs bicycle or are we measuring what's in the blood? And the, the truth be told, you want to know, anybody listen to this, they want to know the best way to deuterium deplete? Take a bottle of olive oil and drink it. Really? That's, how, that's exactly how you can do it. Or coconut oil and drink it. You know, heat it up a little bit and then drink it. That's the best way to make deuterium depleted water in you. It turns out the water you drink, if you understand how total body water works, there's not a huge effect. And people that don't have bad colony of mitochondria, you know who it really does affect? People that do. Like, so if you have a bad autoimmune condition or you have cancer or, I don't know, name the disease, then the, the, the water can help. But if you don't, if, you, if your colony of mitochondria are pretty good, your autophagy and apoptosis are solid, your redox is de a decent. And, and I've never told you this. I probably should since we've been doing this podcast. Redox potential is a measure of the net negative charge in the cell. So between cytochrome 1 and the oxygen, that charge, ideally, when you're, when you're smoking with gas, negative 400 millivolts. It turns out the number that I've figured out in my 15 years of biohacking, when you go below negative 200 millivolts, that's when you're fucked. So guess what? <clears throat> if you're between negative 200 and negative 400, deuterium depleted water really has a negligible role for you. I'd rather see you go spend money on a red light than on the water. Now, it changes when the story and you change. And see, this is the part that didn't get teased out. You know why? Because of the people that you talk to, were they clinicians? They're PhD researchers. Okay? Remember, this they're selling you a clinical story. So you need to know a little bit more about it. Gabor Somali's his book is wholly based around the clinical use 
of this. And you'll notice that his book was about what? People who had mitochondrial heteroplasmy problems. That I can get behind. I can get behind that quite a bit. But are there nuances based on what the mitochondrial problem is in the disease we're talking about? The answer is yes. So does it mean every disease I'm going to go pedal to the metal with this? No. That makes sense. And I'm I'm glad that you answered it to that degree because I was thinking, man, five and a half hours. How did I possibly miss anything? I spent well, you hours. Well, didn't, you didn't mi- you didn't miss it. You, you know what it was, um, and it's because I wanted it to be the definitive series. I on think deuterium. I I, I be you honest, with you, I think for most people on the internet, I still think it is good. But I can tell you, for like people that are going to sign up at the farm, uh, uh-uh, uh, that's going to be a totally different ball game. Um, they're going to learn a lot more about deuterium that way because it's going to be very much applied. The biophysics of deuterium are the key. And it's a very, very important part of what a lot of people are missing. I will tell you, most of the food gurus miss it. But the, the key thing is, if you only know part of the story, that's what I call half-truth. A half-truth always leads to a full lie. And then when you put marketing into it, which is what is going on here, you understand why I'm, I don't really want to talk about it too much. because oh, that's fine. Because I, I, th- that. Because I think that there's an angle there that I'm a little bit concerned about. And I'm not totally copacetic with right now. Sure. That makes perfect sense. Generally speaking, we could say that we'd be um, better served, regardless of what condition our health is, by eating a low deuterium diet and drinking water that's low in deuterium, though. No, I think that's accurate. I just My concern is that when someone is selling you a narrative and they're selling you the product and they're selling you the way to measure it, that is a problem. Well, there's a potential conflict of interest for sure. Not a potential. There is. And the problem is they're not, the way they're doing things with the water that people send in and, and how that data is being handled, I have a problem with this. And uh, to me, it's a lot bigger deal than people want to know. So to go all head bang into this, um, I think you need to ask a little bit better questions. I think you need yeah. to parse the words and, and I hope you do talk to them again. I would actually encourage you to break them all out separately. I think you're going to find that when you talk to one versus the other and the other, you're going to realize what I'm saying. It's just like what cops do with guys <laughs> that are bad guys. When you separate I've them been all, one of those, yes. right. When you separate them all out, you start to find out kind of what the deal is. And that's what you need to know. Because, I mean, ultimately, Luke, you're a biohacker like all the people that follow you. And if you want to do good by the people that follow you, look, even if it turns out that the narrative with them turns out not to be great, dude, it's not that deuterium's, you know, the deuterium depleted water is bad. We know that's good. It's just that the way it, I think it's being marketed and sold to us may not be totally on the up and up. Got it. Cool. Thank you, dude. I appreciate it. We covered everything I wanted to cover. and I guess I some. just talk faster than Matt. It's got to be it. <laughs> Is Matt, he, I mean, he's, my, he's my number one download. I just don't know if he's the longest show. Is it no, the he longest told, he one told, ever? He told Is me it? he was the longest one ever. That's In fact, funny. when you guys were doing that show, I was actually texting Matt. You know, answering the questions, and he's he had his phone on airplane mode. Oh, because you were you could watch the live feed. Yeah, I oh, was. That's funny. Yeah, dude. I was texting him, but he had his phone on airplane mode, so right. he never saw anything. That's funny. Sometimes I forget that I'm 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 doing the live feed for you know the super fans. That Are there people see. still watching this? Oh shit! Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. You got to yeah. be kidding me. Yeah, we're on Facebook and Instagram, yeah. So we've been doing this for like two and a half hours? Like, two and a half hours. Who's ever watching this, you got to get a life. <laughs> no. If you watch this no whole thing. No fucking way. This <laughs> is life. This is life, man. All right, Jack Cruz, let's call it a night. We got to be back here at 8 a.m. for more of these shenanigans. Thank you so much for doing the show again. I'm All right, really bro. glad we got to do it in person. This has been super fun, and I think this is really going to benefit a lot of people because we went, we went into some – some deep stuff and stuff that really matters to people's lives and health and happiness. So thank you. I hope we'll see.